Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge. I'm Ashley Sledge. And let's talk horror. Today we are joined by Jay Kriegers. We will soon be joined by Josh Eppert. While we're waiting for Josh, Jay, um, while we're waiting for people to filter in and waiting for Josh to get here, what can you tell us a little bit about the Daily Horror Habit Podcast? Yeah, so Daily Horror Habit Podcast uh, is a movie review podcast that I do uh, every week where I have uh, generally, it's a guest on, sometimes I do solo episodes, uh, but we do a new episode every Sunday and I just kind of have people come on and talk recent and uh, classic horror movies that uh, we either enjoy or sometimes we try to cover films that maybe are not as beloved as some of the maybe like bigger films out there, but we still kind of like find horrifying merit in it. Uh, and I've been doing it for almost two years now. So I've been really enjoying it. And I mean, and it's I've gotten my to meet. It's favorite podcast, yeah. man. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I was going to say I had such a blast, you know, getting to have you on. And then you had me on your podcast uh, chatting my first uh, horror movie experience with Poltergeist. And then uh, we've gotten to collaborate a couple of times. And, you know, I'm really, really been looking forward to this today. So can't oh, wait. Me too. It's something we've been looking forward to. Um, and with this, um, A Nightmare on Elm Street, how much would you say this movie... Before we get it, like I said, we're still waiting for Josh to get here, waiting for yep. some other people to trickle in for the chat. But what would you say uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street means to you? Oh, man. I mean, I'm a big fan of slashers. And, you know, it's not to try to, like, put any particular franchise over the other. But with Nightmare on Elm Street, the idea behind it being just, like, Freddy is exploiting people's fears. And that's something that I think really shows, and obviously the creativity across all the films and whatnot in the various kills and the uh, the way he likes to toy with his victims, right? I think a lot of uh, slasher icons, they like to play with their victims, but this one always felt more personal in a way that makes it more sinister, right? I mean, sometimes they were creatively over the top in a lot of different ways, but I think that Freddy's sort of just like insidious nature with which he likes to exploit people's inner fears has been something that's made a lot of the kills across all of the films relate not really relate but just be more terrifying to me in a way what regardless of maybe some of the uh effects don't hold up for certain kills throughout the different franchises but just his sure. sort of insidious ways in which he finds out what terrifies you and then gives you your worst nightmare version of that and that that's one thing about a nightmare on elm street that i've always loved too is the fact that you've always had the same guy whether it was um you know, with nightmare on elm street uh, mm -hmm. It was always Freddie and it was always Robert England with Friday the 13th. It was always Jason, but there was always someone else under that mask with Halloween. Mm -hmm. It was always Michael, but there was always somebody under that mask. So with Jason up until the remake or with Freddie, I'm sorry, it was always Robert England. It was right. always the same guy. And it was Captain Charisma. Um, <laughs> so I I'm going to talk about some of the comments here real quick. Uh, sure. Devin says syringe figures kill is up there for sure. That was brutal. Maybe on one of our list. <laughs> I'm, I'm already list. guessing the video game kill in Freddy's Dead will be number one. Well, we don't have to do the chat now because we already know what number <laughs> one is. <laughs> it's funny, and I want to say this before we actually you know get rolling. You know, I know that Freddy's Dead is a garbage movie. I understand that. I get that. But that movie's special to me, man, because my hmm. uncle, when I was a kid, he took me to see it in 3D in the movie theater. And so I'll always have a special place in my heart for that movie. Yes, I know it's not very good. I understand that, but It'll always be special to me just for the nostalgia of going and hanging out with my uncle and actually watching the movie. Well, I got to say, that's something I really, really love about your show. And it's one of the elements that I think makes it a standout for maybe some of the other ones out there. It's just that you, it doesn't matter really how beloved a film is for you to talk about it. Right. And I think that you do a good job of kind of drawing that out of people. Right. Having people on to talk about their first experience with horror or a horror movie that they have a personal connection with. Right. And it's more about yeah. kind of. Get, you do a great job of like getting to know your guests, regardless of whether or not like people agree with your opinions or not on certain films. It's like it's more about kind of getting the uh, nostalgia and the meaning out of it. That's on more of a personal level, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that, Max. That's what we really try to do. We really try to take you back to your first horror movie and you get the sights and the sounds and the smells of what was going on when you actually watched that first film. Yeah. Um, and with the Daily Horror Habit podcast, I do have the link down here in the description as well as i have jay's twitter handle down here as well so make sure you're following him on social media make sure you're subscribing to the podcast i promise you will not regret it um while we're waiting for josh can you tell us about some of the episodes you have coming up yeah so this week uh i'll be covering the grudge 2020 version which you know talking about films that are not uh, widely beloved 
my guest uh, really enjoyed the anthology spin on it. So I'm looking forward to kind of revisiting that one with him, which is a film that I personally didn't care for the first time I watched it. And it's not that I have a great uh, love of the grudge. It just, it didn't work for me in certain ways. So I'm interested in kind of getting to pick his brain essentially about why this version worked for him and sort of maybe getting to uh, look at it in a new lens. You know, I guess that's part of the thing that I really love about having guests pick the movies, right? I don't have to be a fan of it, but getting to have an excuse to like revisit it and then see it through their lens or their perspective sometimes gives me my own insight into it. So going to do the grudge for this coming week. And then the following week, I'll be chatting about the night house, which is a movie that I think a lot of people have slept on. And that might have something to do with the fact that it was delayed because of COVID. And then it had yeah. such a limited uh, theatrical release, but now that it's on video on demand, um, it seems like a film that's ripe for uh, the same type of attention and discovery that something like The Empty Man got, uh, which is another film that I really enjoyed. But it seems like the conversation was so late compared to when the film actually came out. Uh, so that's what we're covering on uh, Daily Horror Habit. But uh, my other podcast, which actually just started getting featured on Blade Disgusting once a week, is yeah. video game focused. And that's horror. Uh, and that's Safe Room. And that's something that every Monday... My co-host, Neil Bolt, and I, who's the video game editors over there, uh, we cover a, either brand new horror games or we kind of have uh, celebrating anniversaries. Like we've covered Resident Evil. We've covered Silent Hill 2, which had its 20th anniversary recently. Um, and so for our episode coming next week, we're going to cover sort of like intro to horror games, uh, games that we find are more accessible than sort of just your run of the mill sort of like m-rated games that a lot of people are like well it's got the most gore so those are the types of horror games i like to play but we're going to try to cover some uh some other horror experiences that are a little more age accessible and some of the ones that were our first entries into the horror genre right because we all start in uh different places right whether we're coming to right. Resident evil or you're coming to something like ghosts and goblins right oh my god talk about a game that haunts my nightmare still uh triple's right <laughs> He says, I watched Ken. I think he's wrong about everything. He's yeah. totally right. He is wrong about everything. <laughs> I've been wanting to watch The Night House. See, I have too. We haven't seen it yet. Um, It didn't play in any cinemas around us, so we didn't get the chance to go and see it. But now that it's out VOD, I think we're going to check it out because it's one. Is it one that you would recommend, Jay? Yeah, I definitely would recommend it. Um, I think that if you enjoyed uh, David Bruckner's other film, The, uh, the Ritual, that's okay. something that people would probably enjoy. The Night House is his same attention to crafting characters that are dealing with some type of trauma. Right. And the night house, I think partially uh, it hasn't people, a lot of people haven't seen it aside from sort of the restrictive nature with which it was released is that the trailer doesn't necessarily do a great job of selling what the actual movie is about. So I think if you go into it expecting another sort of unpacking of people's trauma and how they deal with that with some supernatural, scary spookiness uh, to boot, people will definitely get more out of it. So that's one that I definitely, uh, definitely recommend to people. I'm going to have to check it out. I'm not laughing at you. This just made me laugh. Ghost of God <laughs> too easy. That's the issue with the game. Yeah, that was the issue I always had with it. <laughs> the Ritual was cool. I enjoyed The Ritual as well. Um, that's one that we watched together. Um, if I'm thinking of the same movie, I was on Netflix, right? Yeah, correct. Okay. That's one that I think, uh, I think that's a really great intro to horror movie, which might sound like a, uh, I don't know, some people think that when you refer to like things that are good introductions of the genre, it might be a little dismissive or saying like, oh, it's tame. But I think that, again, like David Bruckner does such a great job of blending really personable characters and real and like believable characters with traditional spookiness and things like that. So yeah, definitely recommend The Ritual again to people that haven't seen it. And The Night House as well. Like I said, I'm going yep. to be checking that movie out. It's a movie that I've been wanting to watch for a while now. For sure. Um, I'm going to try to shoot Josh a text real quick. Yep. I texted him as well. Okay. Um, yeah. As soon as he gets in, guys, we will start our countdowns. I'm very excited about this. Um, when it comes to horror franchises, Child's Play has always been my favorite, but I am a huge fan of Freddy Krueger. I've always said that of the big three, for me growing up, the big three was always Jason, Michael, Freddy. He was always the scariest of the bunch to me. And hmm. his kills were always the most unique. Um and it's one of those things where I definitely want to get into more with this, especially with the kills, because they're so dangerous in this film. All these films. He was super awesome in all these films. Um, I have not watched Lamb. Um, I haven't heard seen it either. 
mixed reviews about it. I've heard some people say that it's more of a drama than a horror. Other people mm-hmm. told me it's some of their best, um, you know, the the best horror movie they've ever seen. So, well, um, it's it's worth noting. Lamb is going to be available through A 24s like w- I think it's one day digital cinema thing that they did for like the Green Knight. So I'm pretty sure because it's one of those movies again that was like a limited release, much like uh, the Night House. So people might have an opportunity to check that out. I definitely had heard as well that it was um, not so much a horror movie. It was more of sort of like this art house surreal drama, which yeah, I don't know, I'm not I'm not opposed to that, but I think that it it has been widely blanketed as a horror movie just because of obviously a 24s history A24. with a art house horror and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then my little buddy Oscar's here. He says, hi, it's my mom and me. I'm Oscar. I'm excited. She knows a YouTuber. Um, he's talking about the movie Mother. Oscar, how you doing, buddy? We're glad that you're here with us. It's nice to see you. Uh, Devin, introductions to horror is an interesting topic. Um, in a standard conversation, would you recommend a classic or something more modern? I think that it goes by who I'm talking to. Um, oh, hold on a second. My dude, Josh Kruger's here. Yo, don't be mad at me, dude. It's been the craziest day ever. (laughs) I'm so sorry, you guys. I've been so looking forward to this. My bad, y'all. Dude, I am not upset at all, man. We're so glad to have you here. I'm going to try to make this a little better for the viewers. Um, There we go. Now you got all of us there. Um, There we go. So, Josh, we were just talking about – what's up, mid-level? If you were going to talk to somebody about an introduction to horror, Josh, would you recommend that they watch something now? Or would you recommend that they watch some like modern or something from the past? I would, of course, I would recommend something from the past, but I'm an old fart. Of course, I'm going to say that. Like, you know, if you're going to ask an 18 year old kid that, I'm sure his answer would be different than mine, you know? Right. Like, but yeah, of course, I'd say, like, to me, you know, I would probably, okay, I did. Like, my daughter, as she gets older, like, she's, able to absorb some horror now uh whereas like back when she was young when my parents let me watch horror when i was like five years old oh Mm -hmm. my god i have these glasses on that's so like embarrassing uh (laughs) so these are my my movie watching glasses and i used to watch (laughs) baseball too but um so i for some reason my grandparents my parents they let me watch any horror boobies had to cover my eyes somebody getting Mm -hmm. hacked to death no problem but There was always like an emphasis on it's fake. So it never like super scared me. I loved it. I was always rooting for Freddie and Jason to win. Like Mm -hmm. the saddest parts of those movies to me were when they died. But like (laughs) I would introduce them to that. And that's what I did with my daughter. It was my birthday. And I said, you know what I want for my birthday? I want you guys to watch uh, the entire Nightmare on Elm Street catalog. And it was like a really beautiful, fun. It lasted like six nights. You know, we do a movie a night, some days two yeah. on Sunday. We think we did three. It was awesome. So that's what I would, um, that's what I would do. I would go to the classics and those to me are like Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, Texas Chainsaw. But hey, I'm old and I recognize that. I would expect a different answer from somebody younger, surely. So the two pressing questions I have before we get started with our countdown. One, Braves or Dodgers? Okay, I'm an NL East guy, man. So I'm born and bred to hate the Braves. But as I soften up as an old man, it's kind of hard to not root for the little guy. They're like this 88-win team, you know. Um, I still think, even though the, the Dodgers are down 4 nothing right now, I still – I just have a hard time seeing the Dodgers really losing. But, God, if the Braves win tonight, oh, it's – you know, then it's really, really tough for them. But – um, Three maybe, one is know. a deficit, man. Yo, yeah. So it's basically over. But if I say that, then the Dodgers will come back and win. But <laughs> I'm not. I, you know what? It's fun to watch baseball when you don't have a dog in the fight. I don't really I totally care agree. if the if the Braves do it. I'm psyched. If the Dodgers do it, I'm psyched. I have so many Dodger friends. Um, I would like Boston to win. I have enough Boston fan friends, but. Astros put it on them today, boy. Woo. Yeah, they did. Yeah, that was not good. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. My other question, Josh, which nightmare was your daughter's favorite? God, I'd have to ask her, and she's not here. I think it like one or three, which I was like, oh, yeah, of course. But she's so not uh, like indoctrinated into this world at all. She's a complete and total newbie. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think she said – the third one was her favorite or the first one. She liked four a lot. 
it's funny though. My wife too. My wife had never watched these, dude, ever. She was not into these movies whatsoever. She married a guy covered in horror movie tattoos. She's like <laughs> not able to watch horror movies. And she watched them all. And even they could kind of feel like the series kind of pitter out a little bit. Like they could feel like the silliness being over the top. And it was yeah. interesting. Of course, I feel that way. I'm a diehard fan, this and that. The other thing, I prefer like a darker Freddy. But you could feel it with them too. Like their energy said the same thing. But I know Maggie did like four. They both really liked four a lot. Mm. And I do like four. I think four is fine. It's not my favorite, but um, Maggie's was one in three. I believe Tammy, she'll be home any minute. We can ask her. I believe hers was four. I believe her favorite was four. Hmm. If it is, I love her to death. That's my favorite. Um, is four really your favorite one? It really is. I think it's a yeah. nostalgia thing just because, like, that's the one I watched the most growing up. Like, hmm. um, and I think the kills in that one are easily my favorite. I think I have the most kills from that on my list. Um and I do want to say to everybody in the chat, whether you're joining us now, people that are trickling in, let us know what your list is. We want to see and hear from you guys, too. So give us some of your list here over here. We would love to see it. Um, we will get started. Justin's in here. Justin, how you doing, buddy? Um, nice to see you here. Thank you for joining us, Hi, my Justin. friend. Um, so we'll start with our honorable mentions. We'll go around the table. I have two honorable mentions. One of them I had to put just because of how it affected the franchise. My honorable mention number one is Nancy and Nightmare on Elm Street 3. The death itself isn't that great. It is kind of uh, unexpected, but the way that it shaped the franchise, the original Final Girl, they had the balls to kill her off, bring her back just to kill her off. I thought that was great. And then Joey's Waterbed in Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Mm. Um, that made an honorable mention because it reminds me of another one that actually made my list that I think was done a little bit better. So those are my two honorable mentions. You want to give us yours, babe? Yeah, I have two as well. Um, so one of them is Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Um Coach Snyder, where he's like getting dragged by the <laughs> jump ropes, and then like with, with all the different like uh, towels, like you know that hurts. And then, have you ever been whipped with a towel before? That yeah. hurts really bad. Oh, yeah. you but, know. I um, have. And then he gets Not dragged wrong. by by Freddy. So that's a pretty cool kill in yeah. in my book. Um, but it didn't make my top ten. And then my second one is um from Nightmare on Elm Street Five. Um, Dan Jordan, where he becomes like his bicycle, and um, they he crashes into the um, the, the semi. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought that one was pretty cool. How he like starts to become the motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. The need for speed. Yeah, <laughs> and and of course Freddy's, you know, witty stuff. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Nightmare Four is near the bottom for me. Another example of Ken being wrong all the time. Jay, we just talked about this. <laughs> Triple thinks I'm wrong all the time. Um, so Jay, you want to give us your honorable mentions? Yeah. So mine is, uh, Marge Thompson at the end of the original. Uh, and that's not so much like because of creativity or anything like that, but more so just, I remember my sort of like visceral reaction to it. Right. The kind of seeing that at such a young age and not expecting like a kill at the last totally. second, right. Being a kid and kind of just, you're, I fell for it. Right. It's the idea that yeah. it's like, okay, well, everybody's now we're going to have a happy ending when no, clearly we're not. And that kind of reset my expectations for the rest of my current sort of like horror viewing and that it's like well it's not over until the credits and thanks to stuff like marvel <laughs> shit could even happen after the credits so you always got to be on uh on edge with your movies rock did roll. you have one or two jay uh, i just had one for that one okay and um i want to say too if the movie would have ended right there a nightmare on elm street would have been the perfect movie Mm. Um, if we wouldn't have had the dumb blow up down coming through the window and that stupid fucking Freddy car, if we would have yeah. ended right with, you know, that it would have been perfect. You, so you that Freddy car. I hate the Freddy <laughs> car. It pisses me off every time we watch it. Really? Ken? Josh, did you have any honorable mentions? Oh yeah. Mine are, I'm not just trying to bite you guys. I have it written on my notes here. As you can see, Nancy from part three, the death isn't that great, but dude, what a powerful moment. When I rewatched it with my family, I cried. I was so reinvested. I hadn't sat and like watched those movies in not like, you know, not in succession like that and not with my girls. You know, when you take in art with other people with you, it changes things. Whenever I make a record, I don't really hear the record till I play it for someone and I hear it in a whole new way. It was like watching these movies for the first time again. And even though like, 
you know, at midnight on any given, like, you know, random Wednesday, I'll watch Nightmare on Elm Street 6 for, I'll watch Freddy's Dead for some reason, but like not mm-hmm. in succession as this thing that we're doing. And I really got to see it in a new way. I cried when Nancy died. I knew it was coming, obviously, but powerful. And I have the the mannequin through the window as an honorable mention because when I was a kid, it scared the shit out of me. And uh, I know it looks ridiculous, dude. I know it's stupid, it's, it's, but God, I loved it. Like you said, like, so those are my two honorable mentions, which are two ones y'all mentioned. But um, yeah, I think uh, I just watched that, uh, the movies that made us on Netflix, the Nightmare on Elm yeah. Street one. Um, those are awesome too. They're quirky and funny Mm -hmm. and God, that scene looks so bad. But when I was a kid, dude, like I loved it. I I knew even as a kid that it looked bad. Like I clearly Mm -hmm. it's a mannequin, like, Mm -hmm. like a blow up doll, whatever going through the window. But like, I loved it. And it's still, it makes me feel like a kid again when I watch it now. So those, those are for sure my honorable mentions. And, um, yeah, I'm not just trying to bite you guys. (laughs) Now, before we get into our top 10, I want to catch up on the chat a little bit. Um, my little buddy Oscar, his mom and him are watching together. He said, "Who is Leatherface?" Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oscar, you gotta watch it, my friend. Charles, what is everyone's favorite Nightmare on Elm Street? Uh, my personal favorite, as I said, is n- number four, but I think Part One is the best in the franchise. What's your favorite one? Um, one. One. Yeah. What about you, Jay? I- yeah, one. I mean, that seems like the stock standard answer, but you know, I mean, like you said, I think that is, overall is probably the best one. Yeah. What about you, Josh? Yeah, I hate to just be like a broken record, but one, I mean, one is just, dude, Nightmare on Elm Street took the world over. And here I am, this little kid. My dad had a friend that called him at like 11 p.m., which is late for a guy with like young kids. And his buddy called him to say, you've got to see this movie, Nightmare on Elm Street, because it was on HBO. And my parents watched it in the living room and I had built like a little some kind of makeshift like uh riser that I could kind of watch it through the crack in my, in my, in my door. Yeah. And like this movie, my dad couldn't stop talking about nightmare on Elm street, him and all his buddies. I mean, Jesus, he was younger than I am now, which is terrifying to me, but uh, <laughs> that energy lives in me. One, it's just the perfect kind of horror movie. I mean, it's up there as one of all time favorites, obviously, and, but yeah. there are other ones. Three is like right there. There are elements of two. I love four is not my favorite favorite, but like, it's in the tie, you know, it's one of the better ones for sure. And, but yeah, I've got to go with one. I try to add all this extra stuff. Cause I'm just saying exactly what you guys say, but yeah, <laughs> what can I do? It's fun. Uh, Daniel says terrifier reminds me of Freddy Krueger. I can see Art the clown because he's so comedic. He just doesn't talk. And I, yeah. I can't wait for terrifier too. Yeah. I'm excited about that one. Hey Josh, wait a you second. Watch the you guys like terrifier? Rewatch? I'm sorry. What did you watch the remake as part of the rewatch? Devin wants to know. Oh, no, we did not do the remake. We did New Nightmare. Um, <laughs> hey, what do you guys... I think we've talked about New Nightmare. What do you guys think of New Nightmare? Love it. I think yeah. that A New Nightmare kicked off. If you didn't have Wes Craven's New Nightmare, you wouldn't have had Scream. And if you wouldn't sure. have had Scream, mm-hmm. it would not have revitalized the slasher genre. I think that Wes Craven's New Nightmare was Wes's way of getting into that meta. You know, putting his, mm. you know, dipping his toes in the water. And then he did a full cannonball with Scream. But I think if you would not have had that idea for New Nightmare, we wouldn't have what we have right now in the world of slashers. So I think uh, everybody says it started with Scream. I disagree. I think it started with Wes Craven's New Nightmare. And then no, you're spot on. Yeah. You're spot on. I hated New Nightmare when I saw it in the movie theater. Hated it. I But I, I got to admit, I was a kid and it kind of went over my head. You know, it was yeah. like I had the same experience. Me, what's that? I had the same experience as you did. Like when I first saw it, I was like, what is this? Like, this is yeah. not what I was expecting. And then you come back to it when you have a little more context and you're like, Oh wait, no, this is actually like genius. Yeah. Um, and see, even like the funeral scene, when you see all the, like, you know, all the old cast members, like Jay Sue Garcia, who played Rod in part one, like you put all those Easter eggs in throughout the movie. You know, I thought it's yeah, brilliant. brilliant. No, it's fucking brilliant, dude. And I think what I was most upset about, with New Nightmare was that Fangoria for months was telling us that this is a return to the darkness of Freddy. And like the, enough of this comedy crap, we're going to the uh, roots. We're going back to the dark Freddy. And I just wasn't quite dark enough for me. And that mm. kind of clouded my, like, I don't think I was incapable of understanding the meta as you put, like, I just didn't, I wasn't thrilled with the darkness element. I didn't think it was as dark, but New Nightmare is an incredible movie. 
And now I watch it with like I'm gifted a much deeper, broader at least perspective. And I think New Nightmare right. is like a crowning achievement, man. I I can't believe I'm saying that. My buddy stabbed the movie screen. He hated it so much. And I don't condone <laughs> that kind of behavior. We were 13 years old, but we hated it. And now I love That's it. So I, just, I think we've talked about that before, but I'm always curious, mm-hmm. like other people's takes on that movie, especially from you guys. Yeah, love it. Uh, Ashley's favorite is one. Jay says the most brutal death was my hopes and dreams after watching the remake. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, my buddy, I knew this was coming. <laughs> Justin's favorite is Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Justin loves it. Me and him talk about it all the time. He's the one I think that gave me the love of it. Um, my mom, Oscar says, my mom said, okay, Oscar, you come over, you hang out with uh, me and Ashley. We'll watch Texas Chainsaw together, buddy. I'd love to watch it with you. Um, Jay says his favorite will always be two. Triple says Terrifier is cool. Yes. Um, are you talking about your favorite nightmare on Elm Street? We are right now, but we're counting down our top 10 kills. A new nightmare is a great cure for insomnia. <laughs> John says, I love New Nightmare. Uh, the reboot, I wish they would have gone with Katie Cassidy final with Kyle Gallner. Ruin a comment about hating she did the film. Okay. Don't laugh, but I'd like to see Rob Zombie direct remake of Nightmare on Elm Street. We've talked about that. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, Go to meal when you're about to watch a horror movie. For me, the, as funny as this sounds, Blackberries. Um, I like to sneak Blackberries <laughs> into the cinema when I, I know, I don't know what it is. It's like a comfort <laughs> thing for me. What about you? What do you want to eat before a horror movie? I, popcorn. I'm lame, I guess, but I love popcorn. Like, that's the whole reason I go. <laughs> like, lots of buttery popcorn. What What about you, Jay? Your go-to popcorn. before a movie. You know, yeah, popcorn. Yeah. How about you, Josh? I mean, popcorn or anything. I'm a fat bastard. Uh, any food, honestly. Give me some food. I'm stoked. Like, popcorn with chocolate and butter in it? Yeah. M&M's in oh, there. Yeah. Oh, God. My mouth just started literally watering. <laughs> that was amazing. All right, Jamie says, I want to say my favorite is one, but really three. And I, again, one through four, I, I think you could legit make the argument is the best. They're, each one of them has their own reason they could be the best. Uh, Jay says, milk duds dumped in a big tub of popcorn. Got yeah. to agree. All right, so guys, yeah, we are awesome. now going to get into our top 10 Nightmare on Elm Street kills. And I want to say off the top, me personally, I did not include any of Freddy's deaths. I don't know if any of you guys did oh. or not. But I personally did not. So mine are all Freddy's kills. So you want to start us with number 10, love? Yeah. Um, number 10 for me was from Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Greta. I think this one was super gross and how, like, he was feeding herself to herself. And, like, her cheeks were all big and fat. And then she, like, chokes in real life in front of her family and dies. Like, that was a super gross scene. And I I don't know. I like, I like gross stuff like that, I guess. <laughs> Pretty girl likes gross things. I do. I like gross <laughs> kills. What about you, Jay? What comes in at number 10 for you, brother? Uh, for me, it's going to be Taryn in uh, Dream Warriors, the Needles one. That's one that yeah. I think is not the most, uh, like in terms of like the prosthetics in it, it's not maybe the best use of prosthetics, but at the same time, I think it's really, really iconic. That I mean, that moment where his fingers come up and it's you're expecting what? The blade, right? The blade glove. Yeah. But comes out as needles, which is like never not shocking. But then I think that it's a great indication of just like Freddie's need to be insidious, right? To really tap into people's kind of primal fears and whatnot yeah. and to personalize the kills, right? It's not just that he's going to stab you to death or he's going to uh, inject you, right? It's that it's tied to the person he's doing it to. And I think that that's a really great uh, instance of just like his insidious nature that only really grows throughout the franchise. Mm-hmm. Right. To, I mean, and like you said, to do that to a recovering addict, right. the one thing she's so afraid of like, falling back to, and right. she just gives into it. It's such a heartbreaking That's moment. Hardcore, too. Freddy. What yeah. about you, Mr. Kruger? What's number 10 for you? I have, and we've already mentioned this one, but I have Dan's death from five, need for speed, where he turns into the motorcycle. Because even though I don't love five, you can see on my wall here, I only have the first one through four represented. Um, yeah. I don't have five or Freddy's dead or, but I, that kill stuck with me. I don't know. When I was a kid and saw it, we just, it lit us up in the room. Now, I also remember it, we, we weren't able to get to the theater to see that movie. We were young, young kids and yeah. my older brother had it on video and I had strict, I had told them they had strict instructions to not start it before I got home. <laughs> and I walk in, they're already three minutes in and you, I don't want to miss the lettering, what that looks like, right. what color is it? And, I made them rewind it. I got in a crying tantrum over it. We pulled it for half an hour. 
And then we all watched it and all of our like spirits lifted with that kill. And we're back to, we're high-fiving and it holds like a special place in my heart. I was jazzed to hear you bring it up before, like as a honorable mention or whatever, but yeah, yeah. I got Dan part five need for speed. Awesome. Um, and it's funny cause I don't know if you were in the chat when we were talking about it, but we were talking about nightmare on Elm street, Freddy's dead. And I was talking about, look, I understand that movie's complete dog shit, but my uncle took me when I was, you know, a kid to see it in the movie theater in 3d. So that movie will always have a special place with me because I think about my uncle taking me and us watching it in 3d and me going to school that Monday and being like, yeah, I watched Freddie's head fucking explode and come right at me. It was dope as shit. So <laughs> yeah. like, I'll always have a special place in my heart for Freddie's dead because of that. Um, yeah, dude. That is the reason I bring that up. Thing. Oh, it really is. And that's why it can yeah. really change a film. Oh, yeah. That's why when I have people on and I do want to promote some things real quick. I've had Josh and Jay on the channel on my first horror movie. So if you want to see what their first horror movie was, check that out. I've already said this before. Jay, his podcast link is down here in the description. So make sure you're checking that out for Josh. If you don't already own every Coheed record, you're doing it wrong anyway. So go and pick those up. And then check out the weird science <laughs> stuff. It doesn't get talked about enough because, you know, Josh doesn't go mainstream. He's so punk rock, even with his hip hop, that he stays underground. That's right. But, um, <laughs> man. I'm telling you right now, Weird Science, check them out. I love what Josh does with Weird Science. Ashley's a Weird Science fan. We're going to be bumping it tomorrow. We're leaving from Michigan to go all the way to Massachusetts tomorrow. We're going to Salem for a four-day trip. <laughs> My so, neck of the woods. Yeah. We're yeah, going to be out exciting. there. Yeah. So we just, um, you know, we wanted to come out, and we're, we've got your discography to bump on the way there. So we're going to have a roll. good time. Um, Dope. That's what's up. Yeah. And the reason I brought up Freddy's Dead and the nostalgia of it is because number 10 for me is Carlos and the hearing aid death yeah. in yeah. Freddy's Dead. Um, now, look, the movie's dog shit. We already discussed that. But <laughs> even as a kid, this kill, and you watch it now, you watch it back, and you talk about the insidious nature of Freddy and how he's toying with him the whole time, you know, dropping the pins, you know, with the hearing aid. And mm -hmm. I, this is just a death. Even then, it just stuck with me mm -hmm. so bad. Yeah, and he's, doing, he's got the elongated chalkboard. The comically oversized yeah, chalkboard, like, he's playing with it. I absolutely love that. So number ten for me is Carlos from Freddy's Dead. Um, I'm gonna catch up on the chat here real quick. Ashley likes to eat sour watermelon gummies. I do like gummies during movies too. I should have said that lifesaver yeah, gummies. Lifesaver ones. I always have to find those for you. Okay, I just noticed you got two guys with last names close to Kruger and Ken wearing a Freddy sweater. Uh, yeah. Josh's last name is not really Kruger. He's a faker. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, man, I, I couldn't imagine having that experience. Also, the people you watch a movie with matters as well. People who get hype, friends, family, loud chewers, etc. Yeah. Absolutely. And something I want to bring yeah. up real quick on that note, Devin, we did not see A Quiet Place 1 or 2 in the theater because no. I'm an old man and I'd have blown the fuck up at people <laughs> that were slurping their drinks. You know? Oh, oh the worst. <laughs> yeah. Dude, did I ever tell you, like, I, I saw the first one in the movie and, like, I'm not a prick, dude. I'm a nice yeah. person. But, like, when you're in a movie and part of the aesthetic is silence, like, have no. some kind of yeah. awareness. And, like, everyone, like, got the most crinkly bag of candy ever. And no, <laughs> like, took concern forever. for anyone around them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I said yep. something to the people at the theater. And they know me there enough. They know I'm a decent guy. They put up a sign outside the theater, like a little stand-up sign. Like, this is a quiet movie. There Try to go. open your snacks yeah. before the movie. Because I was so <laughs> pissed, dude. Um, can you believe I haven't seen A Quiet Place 2 yet? I have not watched it yet. It's yeah. good. I, I mean, yeah. like, I don't think it's as good as the first one, but it's it's middle of the road for me. It's okay. Um, to talk about cool. watching, it's just funny. I'm saving it, I guess. I don't know. I love the first one. I have yeah. not watched the second one. I don't know why. I do that sometimes with things. Maybe I'm saving it. Maybe I liked the first one so much that I'm kind of saving it. I don't know. I mean, I've heard that it's middle of the road. I haven't heard, like... I mean, I heard it was good. I didn't hear it was bad. So I'm looking forward to it. But maybe I'll remedy that tonight. I'm gassed to watch it. I just, like, save it so it's there for me. But then years go by and I never watch it. So it's not really a great system, I got to say. I think for me is the thing that really bothered me the most about that movie is as smart and intelligent as that family is in part one and the decisions they make, they are so fucking stupid in the decisions they make in part two. So that, oh, that's man. the thing that bothered me about it. Um, well, and that'll wanna... be dancing through my mind when I watch yeah. it. So I'm, probably, I'm sure I'm going to agree with you, but, oh. um, I, I do got to tell you this, Josh, I think you'll appreciate it. Um, we were watching Halloween kills and I'm not going to get spoilery here, but we went to the cinema and seen that. 
And when the firefighter scene came on, someone behind us turned their phone on and started recording the movie with their flashlight on. And what I looked back and did the whole, uh-uh, you know? No, then you, turned it, around. it was more like, no, no, turn, no, turn yeah, your then, fucking camera off. Yeah, That's and then they was. didn't turn it off, so I, seen the, I could still see the flashlight. So then I turned around, I was like, shut your fucking camera off. You know, because, like, if you want to record the movie, go ahead, but don't have your fucking flashlight on, shining in everybody's face, being yeah. a dick. If anything, that ruins the quality of it. Yeah. Yes. So I just want, I had to throw that story out so you didn't feel bad, Josh, because I know you're a nice dude. So I had to show that I could be a fucking asshole in those situations, too. So uh, we talked about everybody's top 10 now. Uh, we're going to get into number nine. Jay, you want to start us off this time? No, yeah, hold sure. on one second. Hold on one second. Did you like Halloween Kills? Um, Out of five stars, I gave it two and a half. I think it's right in the middle of the road. That's I gave- fair, yeah. I gave it three the first time, and I rewatched it last night, and I bumped it up half a star. So did, I'm, did I'm not, I'm not in the, majo- I'm not in the majority though. Jay, so you're three and a half stars for for yeah, for I'm, Halloween Kills. What I'm a it? sucker though for what? Michael Myers and the fact that they kind of like made an action horror kind of version of that. It's not in line with the original. So if you're kind of like looking for something in line with the originals, it took the best elements of like the zombie, the like zombie films, like the brutalness of those. Yeah. And applied it to kind of it, it was like times a hundred, but narratively, it, it was whatever. It was kind of okay, yeah. but I got more out of it. I think than most did. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know, but there was a deep message in the movie that didn't get taught. They said it a couple times, but evil dies tonight is something. Does evil really die tonight, to Karen? I heard he, somewhere I heard that in that movie that evil. Might That's die the first tonight. time I heard that line. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to listen real close for it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, to me, I think that maybe once um, Halloween ends comes out, I might like, I feel like, because if you guys remember, I mean, obviously we probably won't remember, but you could go back and do research on this. When the Empire Strikes Back came out, that movie got shit on critically. And then once Jedi came out, people obviously went back and rewatched it. And they, the, the critic, I think that might happen with me with kills. Maybe when ends comes out and I see where we go from here, I may go back and rewatch it. And I may like it more once ends comes out, but I didn't think it was a bad movie. It wasn't awful. No. I would probably give it a three too. Three. Yeah, I think I did hype it up way more than what I what I got, but yeah. And Jay just said, um, he said Jay's my dude. I gave H kills four out of five. Not sorry. I love it. <laughs> I love what I love. I love there's discourse about this movie. What I don't sure. love is how shitty people are being about it. Like, if you like yeah. the movie, cool. If you don't, cool. Someone's making art. Just fucking appreciate yeah. it, man. I mean, you like, never yeah, want people right. to be I, I shitty. But, yeah. No, I did not love the end. I either. did. I hated the end. <laughs> but again, when, when ends comes out, it might rectify what we've seen and what we didn't like. So we never know what's going to happen. I'm excited for ends. I'm, I really think the big thing is, like you just said, we had an extra year to build up the hype around this movie. Yeah. So I think that really hurt me personally when I went and watched it because there was no way anything yeah. they could have done could have lived up to the expectation to what I built for this movie in my brain waiting an extra year for it. So I think that's the big part for me that really hurt the film. I absolutely love 2018. Yeah. So Huge I think that's why, why it was a, a little bit of, not a letdown, but it wasn't, it was, it wasn't a five out of five yeah. for me. And 18 was, was a five out of five for you? Yeah, I would say so. I love it. Yeah, rock and roll. Yeah. I gotta say most, most of my close friends love Halloween Kills. Loved it. Really? Like, like me, I went and bought Peacock and watched it right away because they were like, dude, it's the best in the series. I was like, I definitely don't agree there, but like I didn't hate it. I think 2.5, 3. I'm in that same world. I mean, I gotta watch it again too. I've only seen it one time. Mm-hmm. I need to sometimes see things a few times. I know yeah. there's enough stuff in there that I like. Uh, but there is a little bit of like now, I, I don't mind my Myers brutal. I don't mind my Myers, yeah. you know, like Jason, basically. But, like, uh, it did feel, like, really derivative of the Rob Zombie ones. And there were, like, elements from the sequels. And, and I tweeted about this. I don't know if you guys saw it. But, you know, like the, mob, the Haddonfield mob chasing down Michael. I mean, that's, like, right out of uh, Halloween 4, which I love Halloween 4. But, uh, yeah. you know, there were just, like, these elements, which would be fine. But you've deemed the the sequels non-canon, like they don't exist anymore, and then you're borrowing from them. It feels like a little disingenuous to me. That being said, I do like it, and I did, I like the movie. I'm excited for Halloween ends. Can't me wait. Too. Yeah, Jay, you're a huge Michael Myers guy, right? 
Like, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big Michael Myers guy. So I don't know. I'm, I'm also not like super married to the idea that it can't kind of draw elements from past films and then kind of give us this, a film that is, I think structurally it's kind of a mess, but at the same time, it feels like it's a homage of a lot of different elements from the entire series or all of the Halloween films to a certain extent that, uh, I don't know. I had a lot of fun with it. And like, I was watching it. You want to talk about earlier, we mentioned like, it's the people that you were, or somebody in the comments mentioned, like, it's who you're watching with. Like I watched it with my roommates who once in a while, I talked them into watching a horror movie and every single kill, they had this sort of just like visceral, <laughs> what the fuck reaction to every single kill. And yeah. I mean, not everybody has that experience in getting to watch the movie, but that kind of just like heightened my enjoyment of it yeah. to a certain degree. Cause they're kind of just reveling in this insanity that, I mean, saw some of this in like the zombie films, like I said, but they'd never seen anything like that. And just, I don't know, getting to live through their experience in addition to my own multiple times that yeah. made an impact. No, I, I got to totally with Justin down here. At, at least we're getting new Halloween films. You know, yeah. we're not getting any new Fridays right now. We're not getting yeah. any new nightmares. I'll, I'll take a bad Halloween film or even, I, I don't think it was bad. I'll say a mediocre Halloween film yeah. over none of the Halloween films. So I definitely got to agree with you, Ashley. I, like I said, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's worth a watch. Whether you love it or you hate it, it's Michael, and he's badass. Like, uh, the Courtney in this film is amazing. This is one of my favorite Michaels. And I may be a little bit biased here because a good friend of mine, Douglas Tate, did stunts for The Shape in this movie. So I was very no, excited. He, very cool. He was also, awesome. in, in Freddy vs. Jason, he was the Jason that walked out of the water with Freddy's head. That, that was my buddy oh, Doug. So that's sick. Yeah. That. So it, it's cool that he got to play the shape and Jason. So it's really cool for me. Um, sometimes okay. bad horror campy movies are just what you need. And again, I thought it was campy, but I had a good time with it. There were just certain things I had issues with that I'm not going to bring up because I don't want to get spoilery here because not everybody yeah. has seen it and I don't want to be that guy. Um, but yeah, Jay, do you want to give us your number nine on the nightmare list? Yeah, so mine for number nine, which I think somebody mentioned is one of their honorable mentions, was uh, Joey in the Dream Master with the waterbed. Uh, you know, I am of the age where waterbeds weren't a big thing <laughs> growing up, but I had like was staying with a relative that had one, and I just remember like being like terrible nightmares after sleeping on that because just like having nightmares about drowning and all of these things, and then coming to. <laughs> That kill, like so many years later as an adult and watching it for the first time, it was just like traumatizing because it's basically like my own nightmare come to life. And right. it's not the most, I don't know, again, like it's not the best example of practic the practical work that is in this entire franchise that really shines at in multiple of the films, right? I mean, how many of the other slashers can you say like, oh, there's a handful of really great practical kills in this throughout it in multiple entries? And while it's not necessarily indicative of that, it kind of just feeds into, again, like Freddie's ability to be super insidious and kind of like exploiting the uh, like the male fantasy. Right. The, the uh, Joey has that picture of that like gorgeous woman on the wall and then she disappears and all of a sudden she's in his bed. But then, of right. course, she gets replaced with Freddie who drowns and then stabs him, which is a, goes from a fantasy to a nightmare. Real quick, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Josh? What comes in at number nine for you, my friend? Well, it's funny. I hate to like keep pulling from the same kind of barrel here, but I got Greta, the feeding frenzy. Again, mm. not maybe these are low. They're a great kill, but like yeah. maybe it's lower on my list because of the movie that it's in. And maybe that's not fair. I'm kind of realizing right now. Um, I also hastily put this list together, so it's not like it's not maybe not my best work, but um, <laughs> for all the reasons that you said. I, you know, she's eating herself. She styles her cheeks kind of like explode. It's just a really cool kill. And another one that stuck with me, man. Like I get, it's funny that like, I don't love the dream child, but I swear in the last 10 years, I've probably watched that one the most because I always say, I remember these cool kills and these kind of cool things that happen. And I say, God, it can't be as bad as I remember. And then I go back and watch and usually it is. And you know, <laughs> I, I, do, I like it is. I mean, it's not, it missed the mark for me as a movie, but yeah, my first two kills are from five, but I, I think if those kills had existed in say uh, dream warriors, they'd be higher on my list. And maybe that's not mm -hmm. fair of me. I'm willing to cop to that, but yeah, I got <laughs> Greta in the feeding frenzy is what I called it, but yeah, that's my number nine. See, and again, I don't want, I'm going to be that guy. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> number nine is Greta, man. And I, I think it's the same thing as you. It's, um, it's brutal. 
it's harsh to watch. And it, for me, if you make something that makes me wincy and not want to watch it, you know, just the way, like you said, she's puffy and you can see it all coming out of her mouth. Like, it's just so fucking gross. And mm. so that for me, it had to come up on the list. And I agree with you. I think because of the movie it's in, I had to put it a little bit lower. But it's still one of the high points of that whole film for me, just because of how disgusting it is. So sure. uh, coming in at number nine for me, for sure, is Greta from Nightmare 5. What about you? Um number we're on number nine right yep. okay number nine is nightmare on elm street 1984 mom large um I, okay i guess this isn't technically like the kill because it's where he like is burning and he like gets on her and she burns and they yeah. pull the sheet mm. back and she's like over this abyss or whatever yeah but she's not like really dead yeah, she, yeah she's dead okay well i like that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's totally dead at that moment um, and I, I do want to say something that I should have said off the top. None of us, including Ashley and I, know each other's lists. Um, we've kept mm -hmm. our lists from each other. Um, I didn't ask these guys theirs. So I think it makes it more fun that way. A lot of people don't understand how much we argue about these because I try to sneak peeks at her list all the time and she just well, will he, not. He, he thinks he knows me so well and he can guess and I'm not always <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it makes it more fun and more genuine. So. Um, also, also, I think like with lists, I think people get a little too married to like the order of things. And it's like, yeah. I don't know. It's, I think it's more about like the conversation about we're around it all. Right. I mean, right. Sure, we're absolutely. not going to, we're not going to argue about like, Oh, this should have been six or this should have been right. four. It's like, right. It's more about what is memorable to us for a variety of reasons. There's only so many kills in the series. It's more about what it means to us. At least that's what I think. Exactly. I, I completely agree with you wholeheartedly. That's what makes it fun is the fact that you can get people around and have fun discussing these things. We were just talking about it with Halloween Kills. Have discourse. If you don't like the movie, speak your mind about it, but don't be an asshole to other people. Mm -hmm. um, something that really bothers me, horror means a lot to me all year round, obviously. I try to make a living with it through this channel. But when I see people that are here for Halloween watching horror movies and other people are like, oh, I watch horror movies all year round. It's like, dude, you sound like such an asshole. Like, yeah. if they're here watching horror movies, invite them in, bring them in. Mm -hmm. You know, like we were saying the other day, like I eat three times a day, but when Thanksgiving comes, I still celebrate it. And people are like, I <laughs> eat every day. You're eating now, <laughs> dickhead. You know, so I mean like, it's one of those things where if these people are here, invite them in, man. Right. Okay, Enjoy you're it. the like, fucking best, dude. <laughs> <It's> hilarious. <laughs> You know, so it's, that's just one of those things to me. It's just like, you know, welcome these people in. Tell them to stick around after Halloween so we yeah. can have them as part of this horror community. Don't push what? them away because you're a fucking asshole, man. So, yeah, with that. Um, Josh, you want to start us off with number eight, brother? Yeah, don't kill me for this one. So my number eight, I have the throwback to the Tina kill, which is, I mean, it's on my list, obviously, but I have the throwback from New Nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, you know, skin, little piggy. And... That electrified us, even in this movie that we hated. Even when we saw it in the movie theater and my buddy stabbed the movie screen because he was so pissed off, which is, again, I do not condone that behavior. We were kids. We were 13 years old. Actually, New Nightmare is the reason I ended up seeing Pulp Fiction. Uh, hmm. I went. To, I saw New Nightmare eight times in the movie theater. And I only know because from telling the story over the years, I, I didn't like it so much that I kept having to go back. Like, And I look at it now as like maybe like a more mature voice in me was saying like, Hey, there's good here. You just got to find yeah. it. But I would go and watch it, go and watch it, go and watch it. So I went for my ninth time. It's not there anymore. But what was playing Pulp Fiction. And I, <laughs> I this was a time where if it wasn't horror, I thought everything that wasn't high horror was like, I don't know, like uh, Pride and Prejudice or like some period piece. I thought anything that wasn't <laughs> horror was whack and lame, save for a few comedies, right? I think I was a really stupid kid. Like, I just, if it wasn't horror, I was not fucking with it. So I go into Pulp Fiction, and my whole mind is blown. It was funny and violent and vulgar and awesome and creative. And just, it had just kicked open at 13 years old, just like the scope of what, from there, I went and watched Goodfellas. I'd never seen Goodfellas. I had never seen all these classic movies that were already out. Because they, if it, again, if it wasn't horror, I wasn't fucking with it. Um, but anyway, that that's mine on this one. And I have that one here just for what it did to me. Here was a, an actual throwback. I do wish it was a little bit like the, the and I don't want to talk too much about the original scene from part one, Tina's death. 
That's I'm sure it's on our list and it's coming up. But um, I do wish it was like maybe a little bit bloodier, like the Tina death. But like it's still mm. even in a movie we hated, it just electrified all of us. And again, that nostalgia is still at play. Like when I watch New Nightmare, my skin, my my hair stands up at that part. And yeah. uh, credit where credit is due. Like a piece of art on my screen that I've seen a hundred times still does that to me. So yeah, I'm well, all for the piggy getting skin. And we may talk about that kill more here in the future. Um, before, <laughs> I, before I give mine, uh, Justin says positivity, love, and horror films. Three things I'm all about all the time. Oh, Charles, Casino or Goodfellas? Without Ooh. a doubt, Casino. I'm going Casino, 100%. I am too, you? Ken. I am too, yeah. which is blasphemous to a lot of people. But, dude, Casino is my shit. Like, oh, I just watched it, like, I don't know, maybe a month ago and was, like, taken on the ride again. I just, oh, the scene where they beat Joe Pesci and his brother with it's so, it's as brutal as anything you'll see in a horror movie. And it, it yeah. really it's is. Hard. Oh, it's so, oh, <laughs> what about the grave and the dirt hits his mouth and he's still alive. And those <laughs> bastards that were friends with it. You know these guys. You're going to bury him alive. At least have the, and, 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 and Joe Pesci's character's begging him, just put him out of his, Frankie, just kill him. Or whatever the guy's name is. I don't remember the guy. Yeah. But uh, brutal. I got to go casino. But if casino's a 10, Goodfellas to me is like a 9.25. Yeah. You know, it's like, I right. think I'm a casino guy. Yeah. Well, see, is this your pen? Like that, that whole scene, man. Like, oh, that, yeah. Like, that fucks me up every time. <laughs> uh, Daniel says Goodfellas all day and night. Ashley says Casino. What about you, Jay? Casino or Goodfellas? I think Casino is definitely, I'm with you guys. Like Casino is my preferred film, but I think Goodfellas is like insanely watchable for what it is, right? It's a movie that I probably watch more times a year than Casino, just because again, partly because Casino is so goddamn long, but like <laughs> Goodfellas is one of those movies that we continually like in my house or whatever, we just throw it on constantly or like around the holidays you're sitting around and bullshitting and it's like what are we going to watch? Well, it's either like some throwback horror movie that's on TV or Goodfellas. What else are you going to watch? Goodfellas. Right. It's funny because uh, you were just talking about how long it is. I had it on VHS and it was a two VHS, just like the old Holy shit. I remember that. <laughs> it was one of the two I remember VHSs. that, dude. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Um, so back to the countdown. We're at my number eight from a nightmare on Elm Street for the dream master sucking face with Sheila. Um, this is one that as a kid, I all, Ooh, how sweet dark meat, you know, this is one of the ones that, um, and then when you watch her just, you know, it reminds me when you see her flattened out in the dream reminds me of, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, mm. when she gets her skin ripped off when they're in hell and it just falls down to the ground. With the you know, That's what it has always reminded me of. And before we go any further, I got to give a shout out to Josh real quick because because of your input, Josh, I went back and rewatched Hellraiser and because I've always had a sour feeling for that movie. But when you go in, it's got some of the best body horror I've ever seen in my life. And it, it really is the scene that we were talking about, the Jesus wept. Yeah. Yeah, that whole scene is just so dark, man. But I still prefer Hellbound over Hellraiser 1. And like I said, with, with this, that's what this always made me think of. When you see her deflated body, it's always taking me back to Hellbound. And um, Just just for the record, an inhaler is not going to reinflate your body. It drives me nuts how much she uses that inhaler. She, my, for those of you that don't know, my wife is a respiratory therapist. She's a hero. She battles COVID and stuff like that. I can't watch medical shows with her. Like, yeah, I that fucking do it. She's like, it's just like me. Like when I'm watching someone play guitar in a movie, I'm like, they're not playing the real chords. You know, oh, like, yeah, for when, sure. people, when people are doing that, she's like, that's not really how you intubate somebody. I'm like, oh, Jesus <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Um, it, it's fun, man. It really is. Anton is, hey, Ken, sorry I'm late. I'll tell you right now, my favorite Nightmare on Elm Street kill of all time has to be when Freddie puts his glove through Jesse's stomach in the remake. Very nice. Um, you want to give us your, what are we at now? Number eight. eight. You want to give us your number eight? Yeah. Um, number eight for me is from Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Um, I feel like he does this a lot in his movies, but where um, he stabs the, it's the entity or whatever, yeah. um, where it's the babysitter and they're in the hospital and he, the one that Josh yeah, was talking he about. like pulls mm. her up the ceiling and like the nurses can't see it but um the little boy can i like that oh. one too that one's pretty cool um and then like her neck is broken and that's a, a cool kill to me 
So yeah, that's my number eight. I knew we'd be talking about that one again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Huh, thought I didn't know you all that well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what about you, Jay? What comes to the number eight for you, brother? You know, I think this is at the point where we all have to stop like apologizing for biting one another's picks because uh, yeah. I have Sheila's death for uh, for number eight. And it's not even necessarily for the reasons that uh, Ken had, which is why I love like when we start sort of just like stepping on each other's toes with mentioning the same things is that it means something different to all of us or it hits us all differently for different reasons. And that one is the way it begins, right? Is when you realize that they're dreaming and she's in a night, a literal nightmare and none of her classmates are responding when she's screaming for help. Like yeah. that's the basis of like half of the nightmares I've ever had, right? You're like in a room <laughs> full of people asking for help and they're just oblivious to what's happening to you. And obviously Freddie then sucking the life out of you literally is a, a pretty uh, terrifying cherry on top of that for me. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I'm so glad we get that. That's another thing I like too, is when we're talking about these, um, getting ready to learn about each other's list. When I was putting my list together, I was like, I wonder if they're going to have this one on here. I wonder if they're going to have this one on here. I wonder if this one affected them the way it did me. And so to hear you guys coming up, and like you said, with all of us, having the same ones at the same spots is just so fucking cool to me. Like getting those same experiences. Um, Daniel's got a question real quick. Uh, Thoughts on the Batman trailer. You in or out? Um, I'm in, and I'm going to tell you I'm why I'm all in. the way in. Yeah, dude, and, and this is my big thing. I hear people bitching about Robert Pattinson as Batman. What? Listen, I what? bitched one time <laughs> about a casting before I had seen the film, and the thing I bitched about was the fact that they casted Heath Ledger as the Joker. I was like, <laughs> the fucking ten things I love about you guys going to be the Joker? Right. What a fucking joke! Whoops! Oh, yeah. Thing I hate about you. I'm I like, think. And I yeah. walked I walked out of that theater feeling like such a fucking idiot. I was like, he <laughs> fucking nailed that. So I will never judge a casting until I watch a film. Yeah. And if you watch Robert Pattinson in like The Lighthouse or Remember Me, like the, yeah. the guy's a good actor. Yeah. Fucking the, great like, actor. The, anybody that can play, yeah. I hate that he's typecast as the Twilight guy because he has such range and he's so yeah. amazing. So anybody that shits on Robert Pattinson, I'm always like, go watch the lighthouse and then come back and tell well, me this guy can't fucking act. So dude, the lighthouse. Yeah. Daniel, thank you for the question. I think so all good. of us agree. We are all in. I haven't yeah. seen it. I haven't seen this. But you got to check it out. It, it looks you, really you good. Usually you share this yeah. stuff with me. I know. It looks tough as shit. Yeah. Um, Anybody that complains about Robert Pattinson at this stage in his career is telling on themselves that they haven't watched what he's done in like the last yeah, four yeah. or five years. I mean, right. totally, totally. He's totally, so right. outacted whatever he w- be- got his name for that. I don't even think of, I don't even associate him with that anymore. Just based off of. I, I, I don't either. Okay, me neither. Yeah. Like yeah. he's not, he doesn't even register to me. No. Yeah, Twilight was forever ago. Yeah. Robert Pattinson is like, exceptionally talented killing it It might have took till the lighthouse for me to like fully get it what was that other movie uh was it the Um, one from the guys that did uncut gems good time yeah good time good time good time the rover um what the he did a space movie that wasn't very good but he was really good in it i can't remember what it was called but yeah he i'm excited i'll go i'm not like I'll wait and give him a chance. I'm excited that he's yeah. Batman. And the trailer looks bananas. I mm. love the little teaser. Now the full trailer. I'm yeah. I'm so in. I, I can't wait, dude. I cannot wait. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be badass. It looks dark. It looks fucking tough. I'm looks like super seven. Super duper stoked. Super stoked. Yeah. Yeah. And Thomas joined late, so he didn't get to hear one, one, one. <laughs> Everybody else <laughs> one. I was the only one that fucking picked four. Um Devin says, oof, uncut gems had me more stressed than many horror films out there. I loved it. I oh, agree. for uncut sure. Gems yeah. is fucking great. Such oh, it's great tremendous, movie. dude. It's a panic attack in a movie. <laughs> I like I felt like I took an airplane ride that had turbulence the whole time. Like my knuckles were raw. And yeah. the fact that dude, what a movie. Uncut gems is brilliant. It's yeah. it was yeah. so good. I called up Claudio and Travis and our tour manager, Chuck. We all had a plan to get together. I got I brought my iPad, which had, I got a screener from, I probably shouldn't say this, but a friend of mine who does movie reviews. This is before it was out on any streaming or anything. It was in the movies. This is pre-pandemic. Um, or maybe right around. Yeah, it was pre-pandemic, Pre- right? Pre-pandemic, definitely. Yeah, because we all got together in Nyack and we watched that movie together. Me, Claudio, his wife, 
Travis and our tour manager and our tour manager had to hit pause and take a minute. Dude, he had to go out and get fresh air, which I was pissed that we hit pause. Like, no, <laughs> dude, yo, he really needed it. He really needed it. Yeah. He was like, I'm either about to run through a brick wall or drink myself into a stupor right now. Like I can't even take it. And it was real, dude. He was beat yeah. red. Uh, that, that is an incredibly like powerful thing. Uncut gems all the way. Brilliant. Yeah. The picture and I like uh, Good Time, Good Times or whatever it's called. I like yeah. that movie too. Necro is in it. Underground mm-hmm. uh, horror rap motherfucker yep. Necro. Yeah. Necro is crazy, man. Um, I gotta watch that too again. I mean, I've only seen it once, but I loved it. Um, you okay, need a, you need some time away from their movies, right? You can't. That's yeah, not a one yeah, that you're gonna totally. rewatch anytime soon. But you're definitely planning the next rewatch like almost before it's over. Yeah, I felt so lucky to have gotten to see it and like not in the movie theater. And I got these great screeners. I got a few other movies too. She's a, a writer for a magazine. She's like, Hey, I have these screeners. Do you want them? And you get a link to it yeah. and it works for 10 days or something. And so mm-hmm. I was just like, I watched it like four times in 10 days and probably took two years <laughs> off my life. Or maybe I added time to my life. All that cardio, my heart just racing. They say that's good for you, right? Great movie. I love those dudes, man. Great movie. Terrific mm-hmm. movie. I agree. And if you haven't seen Uncut Gems, I strongly recommend you watch it. Maybe have some Prozac with you. Calm yourself down. Might have to take a pause and piss Josh off, but make sure you check it out. It, it is a fun movie. It, and not a horror movie, but it is very anxiety driven like a horror movie is. So it's a thriller. Um, it's thrilling, oh. dude. It's oh, a yeah. total sure. thriller, but man, yeah, I love that movie. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. It's so good. Yeah. So um, back to the countdown, number seven. Um, I tried really hard to broaden the horizons here and not reuse any film. So I had to get one from Night Round Elm Street 2010. And that's Dean suicide at the booth with the knife at the very beginning when oh. he's cutting his own throat. Like it's it's such to me, that's one of the highlights of that whole film. Yeah. So it, you know, watching him cut his own yeah. throat and everybody around him is just screaming, wondering what the fuck is going on. So um, in a movie that and I will say this, too. Honestly, and I get shit on for this. I think that Nightmare on Elm Street, the remake, has the best ending of any of the Nightmare on Elm Street films. Um, what it happened look the greatest with him. Yeah, I don't even remember. I think I blocked when it When he out. comes through the mirror and grabs the mom and pulls her back in. Uh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's, that's the, yeah. all the, the problem with the Nightmare on Elm Street franchises is always have, they have these amazing movies and they shit on the endings. They, it's like they can't write an ending, whether it's Freddie getting holy water poured on his bones or looking in the mirror and having little pieces of him pulled apart or a stupid mm. fucking Freddy car driving off into the sunset. There's always uh, some bullshit. It there. wasn't a Freddy car, man. <laughs> it wasn't like, uh, it just was, it was a subtle red and green top. And I, dude, the first few times I saw it, I don't even think I noticed it. Of course I was six, <laughs> but you know, like, uh, I feel you. It is pretty stupid. I it just you can't get me to diss that ending only because it's attached to you know one of the hallmark pillars of everything that I love to this day at forty one. So, but yeah, it is pretty stupid. Um, I remember now the mirror thing. It looked like yeah. real digital though, right? Like yeah. he grabs her and pulls her. Yeah. Uh, the throat stab. The throat that was ill, dude. That's like and it yeah. happened early on in the movie, and you're like, yeah, yeah, maybe this is gonna be dope. But then quickly you realize that that's not. <laughs> it's bad. not. That's it was not dope. It was I not. I gotta dope. give some love. No. My little brother's here in the chat, Donovan. He's a huge hey, what up, buddy? Hey, Josh, when I told him you were down here, he freaked out. Oh, okay. So that's, 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 that's my little Donovan. brother. He's here watching. Hey, um, you want to give your number seven love? Yeah. Um, number seven is from 2010. Also, the remake. Um. Like I said before, he does the levitating above the bed a lot. Um, and then, like, you see the four scratches go down. Um, oh, what's it? Chris, the blonde. Yeah. Got her chest. <laughs> yeah I, I thought that I I went between the knife getting cut in that one, and I chose that one over it. I knew you were going to go with that one. See? <laughs> you guys are so one. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jay? What comes in at number seven for you, brother? Uh, for me, it's going to be prime time which is uh Jennifer's death. Uh, that was one, that was one that I remember like on being in one of those, they don't, I don't think they really do them anymore, but like TMC or sci-fi channel did those like hundred scariest moment features every yeah. Halloween season. Like that was my first introduction to so many different horror movies before. Cause my parents weren't big in the horror. So I kind of like came to those things late from grandparents that would record them on VHS and then like ship them like eight states away to me so that I could watch them and be exposed to like all these wild ass 
scenes that I had like almost no context for, but yeah. I mean, if you want to get somebody interested in a movie, like you show them a wild scene like that, that is unlike anything a little kid had ever seen before. Like that one has stuck with me. And then of course it introduced me just to like the entire franchise. So for nostalgia's sake, like that's, that maybe should be, uh, should be a little lower on my list towards the beginning of my list, but that one definitely is uh, stuck with me all these years. What later. prime time, bitch, dude? I'm surprised <laughs> it's that low. Like, I know. that's, I know, a that's killer kill, dude. Like, my, so, I'm trying to have like an old school TV put in the corner of my movie room. <laughs> when well, I'm trying to get this you, dude from Devil's Latex yeah. to make it, I'm always in his ear yeah. about it. He's like, yeah, one day. But I was gonna say, dude, you know, a prop a kill. That's on my list, but it's it's. It's much higher, but that's a. That's I a bring great that up on the podcast all the time when we talk about Nightmare Josh. I'm always like, my dude Josh, man, he's gonna get the TV with Jennifer hanging out and put up on his wall. <laughs> I talk yeah, about dude, that shit that. all the time, man. Yeah, just like it's a real dream of mine. Um, and that just, ah, oh God, you know, like we always talk about. Not, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but like. The, the comedy element was really upped in three, as much as I love yeah. three and. And I don't mind Freddie's quirkiness. Like in three, it's no. like clearly, I mean, Freddie was full on on kids' lunchboxes and backpacks, and he was a full <laughs> pop culture icon by part three, and they leaned into it. But it was like, dude, we my father took us all to see that in the movie theater, me and all the neighborhood kids, because we had to have an adult with us. Yeah. My dad's awesome. We weren't like <laughs> five or six. We were just he got permission from everybody's parents. And some parents were like, really? You're going to bring them to see that? But, dude, Freddie was the talk of our school. The kids were watching it somehow. And here comes my dad uh, looking like he's got, like, the fucking kids from the U.N. We're all different shapes, sizes, <laughs> colors, all trotting in behind him. And we just – it lit us up, that kill, dude. Like, welcome to prime time, bitch. And also in the Greta kill when he's like, bon appetit in the camera. Like, I feel like yeah. it like pans in, bitch. I love it. <laughs> If Freddie just said bitch before every kill, I'd love it, dude. I, I yeah. just love when he does that. But in part three, it was like, I don't know, God, it's coming back to me right now. I felt like connected to my dad because here we are yeah. laughing together. Like my dad for an hour and a half got to not be a dad in a way. Mm. And my dad was just another kid who just happened <laughs> to have a beard and was allowed to, you know, march us all into the movie theater. And really, as we talk about it right now, dude, it's really coming back to me and I love my dad, man. That's that's a, a cool memory for me. And I'm still friends with all those kids that wa marched into the movie theater with me. Um, they are my they were my best friends then. They're my best friends now. We talk about that kill all the time. Three <laughs> is chock full of awesome kills, honestly. Yeah. I mean, three is incredible. But that one is such an awesome one. I'm glad it was on your list there. I was yeah. shocked that it was that low, though, just to me. But I think you can see why it has so many... That nostalgia, it's hard to compete with nostalgia in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Please tell me Kwame was with you. Oh, you know he was, dog. I know. Was I knew he had up to be. That's yeah. fucking so dope. I, I, I wanted to sit with you and Kwame and watch a horror movie and see how he reacts to it. Like, he's yeah. the dopest dude in the whole world, man. Yeah, he's got the Mount Rushmore tattoo, but it's like Freddy, Jason, Pinhead, and Leatherface instead of the yeah. president's. Kwame, you know, we grew up, like, I don't know, man, we weren't like cool, you know, in school. And I think we were looking back now as an adult, we were probably like, Quam didn't realize that he was a big guy. He used to get picked on, if you can believe that. And my dad one day was like, he said something and I couldn't, you know, I was like, dad, Robert's picking on Kwame. My dad was like, wait, that little skinny kid is picking on Kwame. And I was like, yeah, you got to go help Kwame. And he was like, I think I better go help Robert. Like, cause, uh, <laughs> Kwame was such a sweet guy. Like, he didn't, Kwame's like a gentle giant. Hmm. I mean, you know, he grew up, you get on his bad side, it might be a bad day for you, but like, he's a sweet, gentle man. And like, I think horror was a refuge for us, man. We like, yeah. we went to a school that was really tough. We were on a bus that was really tough. We used to make the cops ride our bus with us. We're just kids. And, Cause the kids would wild out, throw rocks at cars kid got stabbed on our butt craziness Jesus. It's a bad, yeah dude and it i think horror was our refuge a lot so yeah. picture my parents they walk into my room and it's just me and kwame sitting there with our jason masks on just holding <laughs> actual real knives just hey we just hang out in our jason masks all day and like, we love horror just like you guys love horror sorry i'm going yeah. down memory lane here for myself like wow that shit really blows my mind that's half, that's half the reason why we get together and talk horror right 
Yeah, exactly. rock and roll, man. I was just going to say, like, for the people that don't know here in the chat, um, first off, I got to pit myself a little bit. Hit that subscribe button. It means the world to us when you Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Um, the thing is, like, that's why we do My First Horror Movie. That's the podcast that we do here. Because you get to... I don't remember my first comedy. It was probably Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Um, but I Great. know for sure what my first horror movie was. You know, And that's something that stuck with me and the nostalgia that comes with it. I think it's very important to talk about those things. And that's why we started doing this podcast. And that's why I love doing these top 10 rankings. Because it takes you back. We always do top 10 rankings of older movies right yeah. now. Because it takes us back to when we were kids and the feelings that we felt when we seen these deaths. And that's why there are number ones, number twos, number threes, because of the ways we felt when we watched them the first time. So um, you want to give us your number seven, Josh? Okay, don't. Okay, this might sound crazy to you guys. <laughs> it's not a great kill, but it's more like an accumulative of the kills and what happened in the scene. This is from part two, the pool scene. Now, don't. Mm. Now, listen. You are all my children now. I mean, I was talking to a tattooer, putting that whole scene on my back, and I'll still probably do it one day when I can work up the nerve. And I I used to be able to sit for hours, like, no problem. Now, like, 40 minutes into a tattoo, in my mind, I'm like, why did I do this? This is <laughs> fucking horrible. But, like, that is an Don't iconic you have an scene. What's that? What? I, I still have a tattoo that I need to finish. Jump from, like, pussy. from, like, a year oh, ago. Yeah, I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. Um. But, okay, so you are all my children now is just forever tied to that scene. And even though these deaths are quick, he throws somebody into a fire, he stabs a kid into the stomach. It just, it, for me, I felt like this is still, like, kind of low on the list, you know? But, like, that scene has to be mentioned if we're talking top ten anything for Nightmare on Elm Street. For me, I know two is a very unique there's a real like sect of love for part two. Uh, if you know, to talk about it, a lot of people are like that's my favorite one, and I get it, dude. It's yeah. dark as can be. It's super duper dark. I love that. You know what's funny to Freddie in part two is like you've got the body, I've got the brain. More in line with part one. What's funny to him is cutting off his fingers and laughing, or like slicing yeah. his. You know, he's he's so dark. He's a demon. He's evil. He's not. What's wrong, Joey? Tongue tied? That was the shift, and that happened in three. The You Are All My Children Now was dope. That's an iconic yeah. Freddy Krueger scene. So I put it on this list. That's You talked about broadening the, the scope, you guys. Yeah. That's me kind of broadening the scope. There's not <laughs> one kill in that scene in particular uh, right by the pool there that, that really sells it, but it's the scene as a whole. And that's like kind of an yeah. accumulative thing and topped off well, with the You Are All My Children. Well, now, yeah. that's my shit. And we've never got to see that in another film. Yeah, it's always we've never seen him and yeah. Yeah, it's always person. him in one person's dream. Oh, good point. Before. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, like, that's what I love about that kill. And I think that that is what, real quick, I want to catch up on the chat because I'm going to get right back to that point. Um, Ali says, my favorite kill is Grady's Death of Nightmare 2 with dead mom stuck on the other side of the door. Some more love for Nightmare 2. Mount Rushmore Tad of the Slasher sounds great. That's freaking awesome. I agree. <laughs> it says, uh, Nene, thanks for coming back. Um, yo, what's up? Freddy vs. Jason was a fun movie, but wish it had more Freddy kills. That's what I was just going to get with. I was really hoping for a big scene like that in Freddy vs. Yeah. Jason where we yeah. were going to have the ability to have Freddy come and get a whole group's worth of kills rather than just one kill at a time. Yeah. That is one of the parts that missed the mark in Freddy vs. Jason for me, I think. And Dude, when Freddy, totally. Yeah. When they brought him out, and like he's chasing that chick from Destiny's Child, and he's just like, and then you know Jason gets her. I was like, oh, that was she your like chance. Flies yeah. across yeah. the flies country. across the whole world. Yeah, but yeah. He definitely had I kills. Jason did. Yeah, I really mm -hmm. wanted to see a huge group kill like that. I would love to see that in a Nightmare on Elm Street film again, where he gets brought out and mm -hmm. goes, and, you know, at a party or something. Maybe someone's drunk and they bring him out. And he just attacks this whole party. <laughs> I think that would be so fucking sick to see something like that in another film. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm like 100 percent Giving so, him a huge set number, piece would be awesome. Oh my gosh. Even if we did that one again and just had that broader sure. horizon. Oh yeah. I'm I'm so in. Absolutely. Versus Michael. <laughs> All right, you want to give your number six, my love? Um, yeah. Um, my number six is from Nightmare on Elm Street three. Um, Phil, where he takes like his veins and makes him okay. Well, you have that one this low? Yes, I have it this low. <laughs> that, that's See, crazy. He's so <laughs> <laughs> where he's a puppet. Yeah, he's yeah we know it. it's just way higher oh. on ours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it's a, a good scene. Yeah, yeah, it is. 
I love that one, but yeah, it, it's incredible. number six for me. Losing. Why is that one so memorable for you? Um, just because I I just like how he rips out his veins and he oh. makes a puppet oh, because yeah. like I like it. I like the puppet Freddy too. I think he looks yeah. really mm. cool. What, and then he, you know, he's like when he's doing the, the stop motion when yeah. he first becomes the puppet. Yeah, I love that shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah dude, that then that that kills early on in the movie too, and it oh. really set in. Oh, it was it like really, wow, really is. dude. And well, it's brutal. It dies, it the comes with that well, you know, when Joey's like trying to well, well, yeah, when Joey's running up. through and he's hitting, the, you know, the doors with the tray. Mm. Oh, and yeah. the music, like, Ken. The music is so when yeah. Joey's running through and hitting the. You care, dude. Like, oh, three is incredible, dude. Fuck, yeah, yeah. I might have to watch that tonight, too. <laughs> so good. Well, and you feel like three is like really well acted. Lawrence Fishburne, mm. they brought back yeah. Heather. But like, yep. all those kids did a terrific job. Oh, and they're God. screaming yeah, they're, from yeah. the window, Philip, no. And then when they're explaining to the doctor after his eyes were open, he was fucking awake. And like, yeah. they don't, we, we never understood like once. Freddie, as kids, I remember like these were the conversations on the playground. Like once Freddie had you, it didn't matter if you were awake and like mm, how yeah. was he able to walk through the doors? But they were kind of like maybe there was a little bit of like Freddie can do everything, kind of figure it out as we go. But um, <laughs> we were always trying to figure out like the the rules to Freddie's realm, and, and these were the arguments on the playground. And kids would yeah. fight yeah. over this shit in my school and whatnot, but. <laughs> Phillips is one of the highlights of the whole series in my in my eyes. When they to this day, when they pull the veins out of the skin, I go, oh god, it's yeah. just brutal, yeah. but so creative and cool. All right, I'll shut up. I get all excited I, I, I like, and start talking about. I'm sorry. Like yeah, she's definitely she's definitely the gore hound in the relationship. This is true. I have no problem. <laughs> she's more you know saw where I'm more notebook. So uh. definitely, she, she's definitely the gore hound of the two of us for sure. I'm like, you're closing your eyes, Chrissy. Open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, Ken, we'll funny. have to do top 10 rom-coms with you sometime on a different podcast. Yeah. Love it. I would so be in. Um, you want to give us your number six, Jay? Yeah. So mine is, I know you said that you weren't going to include any uh, Freddy's deaths for yours, but for me, it's Freddy's death in uh, the Dream Master at the very end of it. And I just, uh, Dream Master, I know you said that's your favorite. That was one that it took me a couple of views. I know uh, Josh said earlier, like it takes him a couple of views sometimes of the movie for it to really click. And that was one for me that like, I've had one or two favorite kills from that. But then on a rewatch, I was like the significance behind getting to see his death and kind of, they give you that inner look at the inside of him. And you just kind of see Uh. the writhing bodies of all the people that he's been killing over the, however many years he's been doing this and just, the whole body horror element of it where you start seeing like appendages springing from him. And then yeah. you get to see his victim's revenge in a certain way, uh, which I just love. And that's one of those scenes that I think amongst all the other Freddy deaths, it really stands out as just being significant. And also just, we're finally getting to like some of my favorites where the practical work for it is really, really well done. Like you yeah. see them writhing underneath his skin and then you see them finally bursting through and they like rip his jaw open and all this that's stuff. That's the is, coolest part. Woo, yeah. Super yeah, gnarly awesome. and holds up incredibly well. Yeah, good call. Yeah, good that's call a good there. one. So, yeah, what about you, Josh? Okay, this is where my, I have Welcome to Prime Time, but we talked about that one already. But um, again, just a pillar for us. Electrified us as kids. Want, I always tell anybody who will listen and loves horror, I want to get like a, you know, some kind of model and have it be life size. And one day I will, but it's going to cost a shitload of money that I don't have right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's mine. That, that's my number six. And, it's, well, I, and to me, that's pretty low on the list. But when I look at these, I think it's a fair assessment. Like I had yeah. a bunch of notes, you know, so looking forward to this and like going on YouTube and rewatching all the kills. And like, I have so many mm-hmm. of them in my mind, but like, I switched this list around. I've got like 50 pieces of paper like this because I kept switching it around. Yeah. I, I feel I like that might be a little low, but like, I don't know. When I look at my tops here, I'm going to stick with it. But yeah, my six is, is welcome to prime time. It made the list. That's what's important. But yep. yeah, yeah, for sure. Josh, one thing you said earlier that I thought was interesting was um, talking about like the shift in Freddie's personality, right? He became more of after three, more of like a mascot, right? They kind of moved away from that darkness in a lot of ways, kind of like with the, the cutesy kind of lines. But at the same time, I think three and that kill in particular, still, it has that sort of line where it's like, welcome to primetime bitch. So you laugh at that, but it never loses sight of like the fact that he is exploiting something that is near and dear to somebody's heart that he's about to kill. Right. And I think that three and I, 
to four for a large extent, more so than obviously anything after four. Uh, sure. It, it stays true to like a nice, healthy balance between the first two and then sort of three and four and where we know the series eventually heads with their uh, sort of just portrayal of Freddie and that persona. Right. Yeah. Well said, Jay. And like, yeah. I'm, I'm with the shift, like three yeah. for all, like people love three and people love three. And that, that is where like the biggest leap took place because three and like you said, to a larger extent, four as well. But I think like sometimes four catches a little bit of heat because it's kind of the beginning of the path of it going off the rails. Not that it did in four, but that right. was, I, I think I'm guilty of that. But like I said, when you look at my wall, I got one, two, three, and four up there, you know? Yeah. So obviously I do love four, but like, you know, Freddie, it was still dark in three. We were new. The old, Most of the Freddie we had was the dark Freddie. This, mm-hmm. this guy in part three where the gags were up, you know, they leaned into like the, I don't know, the icon, the iconicness of it. That's a terrible use of the word iconicness. It's probably not a word, but uh, they, to me, they leaned into it and it, I have to say, for me personally, it plays a little better in three than it does in four. But mm, for four sure. has some of my favorite kills in it as well. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know. I, you know, I think with movies, I'm always re-examining how I feel. And it kind of changes and evolves or devolves, I guess, depending on who you ask. But, um, you know, I think my, my four is the most kind of tumultuous in a way for me because I've really changed a lot. I used to say I didn't like four. I'm almost like ashamed to admit that. And like I told you, it was my wife's favorite. Maggie loved it. And we watched four and I was like, damn, four is really good. I think it's the one scene on the beach. I think that's the scene Mm. where I was like, I equate it with some of the corniness of five and Freddie's dead where Mm. he puts the sunglasses on it. I have no real beef with that scene now. I think that's where that stemmed from, but I'm a fan of four and I, I Mm -hmm. like quirky silly freddy it, g- it gave us some of the fucking best kills too like mm-hmm. uh you know zany freddy or whatever but mm-hmm. um yeah okay you got i'll well, shut up sorry no no i i what i agree with you on here is the fact that you just couldn't hold robert england down with his charisma you know like mm. the, good point good point like, yeah yeah you couldn't keep him down that far because he just he's too he's too charismatic and yeah. you knew that you what you were going to get with him and so i think that's where it really turned around was let him be him you know, um, and, yeah, and hold on. That's a great point, dude. That's a really yeah. terrific point. The more comfortability that they have with Robert, the more of like Robert probably comes through. And what was what was yeah. what was silly? And he was allowed five percent to come through in the first one and second one. And they gave, they gave him they have faith in him and they believe in him and let him go further with it. And his personality really shine. That's an argument. I never really kind of contemplated before. Dude, that's a really great point. That's a really well, great point. If you look it up, yeah. he ad libbed the welcome to primetime bitch line. That was not in the no. script. Oh, I think I did Robert. know that. that yeah. yeah. His only like ad-lib in that movie. That, ever- that was the only, that was the first time he had ever ad libbed a line in a nightmare on yeah. Elm street movie. And after that, I think they were kind of like, I seen that on something. Yeah. yeah let this cool. guy run it. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. A good point, I mean, yeah. especially with like five and Freddy's dead, who's to say that his charisma isn't the only thing that makes those memorable, right? Because really those, those, those are the only parts of those two movies that I would assume we remember or remember fondly at the very least, right? I mean, it's that yeah. charisma coming through. So I think by all accounts, that's what really makes those even like worth mentioning, right? I mean, we've made the joke about Freddy's dead a couple of times already in the time that we've been talking, but I mean, his charisma is the only thing that I remember of those. And it's something that eventually would give us like the new nightmare. And then Freddy versus Jason that came through and whatnot. So, yeah, I, don't know. And I, I love not all bad. New nightmare because he does go back dark in there again, yeah. um, which is a segue into my number six. But before we get there, um, Devin says puppet kill top three for sure. It gives you that feeling in your stomach. Mm. Jay says we need a Freddy found fit, uh, found footage movie where a family moves into Nancy's old house and begin catching supernatural <laughs> things on film only to find out it's Freddy. I'd be down with it. Right, it, nightmare right. Movie, would y'all want a remake or a new story? I like that idea actually. Of like a found footage Freddy. Would you guys yeah. like to see another remake or would you like to see it taken in a whole new direction? I want to see a sequel before Robert England is dead. What well, imagine they gave us that? Look what look, look at the success of Halloween. Mm-hmm. A sequel. Yeah. Now, yeah. I would never suggest making all the other nightmares not canon, but like maybe the studios are now like wait a second we don't have to keep shelling out these remakes we can actually do sequels imagine one more romp with freddy krueger with robert england yeah yeah well we've been talking about his charisma 
awesome. I mean, we're talking about his charisma. They have to bring him back, right? Because we saw how that went last time with, um, right. I forget what his name is from Watchmen. But um, yeah, I mean, you have to have Robert England, And then I'm, I'm of the opinion, like it's either way, right? I see it from a fan's point of view. I want something new. Mm-hmm. I want something I haven't seen before. But at the same time, like the realist in me is like, well, studio is going to want something at least halfway safe. Right. So right. yeah, the remake, dude, like give us something new in a sequel, take the story somewhere well, like totally yeah. fresh and like, yeah, I mean, have Robert England, maybe Freddie gets old. I don't know. Like something I would do anything. Well, and if there's ever a chance of that happening, I think it's now with the success of the Halloween yeah. sequels being yeah. not remakes and, and like tying into the originals, but we'll see. I mean, fat chance probably, but right. who knows? Well, Jay Robert says England, I'll like, always pay to see Robert England. And oh, I don't yeah, know if you guys watch the TV yeah. show, but the Goldbergs, you guys watch that comedy show, the Goldbergs. I mean, I've uh, seen I, it a bunch of times. I, I'm I not like super well versed. I mean, Robert England played Freddie in that. He oh, said, I oh. did know that. I don't know if I saw it. I did know really? that. What happened to <laughs> No, it, it, he was just playing a little bit role. He killed Freddy, everybody. But he was still, Captain Christmas. He looked good. He sounded good. It felt good. Like he killed it everybody. Was fun. And <laughs> Daniel's right. It was Jackie Earl Haley that played. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, but we were talking about number six. And we were talking about Wes Craven's new nightmare. Mine's Julie in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. And mm. what I like about this death, in comparison to Tina from the first one, is in Tina's, all you see is her going up the wall. But in this mm-hmm. one, we actually get to see Freddie doing it. At times, it's just her. But at other times, they have Freddie dragging her up. And we see him cutting through her. And, you know, due to budget reasons, what people don't really remember is A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original, was a low-budget film. Ultra low-budget, yeah. Yeah. Super. So they didn't have – I mean, Freddie Krueger is in that film for seven minutes. Yeah. yeah. Robert England <laughs> has seven minutes of screen time in Nightmare on Elm Street because they didn't have to the makeup to do it all consistently the same. So that's why he's always in the shadows or barely visible because of the low budget. Hey, you know what? That's one of the things I didn't love about four is that the makeup had, and and I'm sure it was like uh, born of necessity. He was going to have tons of screen time, but it dried up so much. Mm. Now I'm not saying that he looked better in one, but I did like the dark in the darkness and kind of wet. This is the God. As opposed to like, hey, uh, I'm eating a meatball. Oh, that meatball scene is dope, actually. That could have been an honorable mention where he sticks it through the guy's head and eats it. Yeah. But it kind of dried up, so to speak. Whereas in three, it still looks kind of wet. In four, it really dried up. Still looked great. Didn't look bad, but it dried up on me. And that was always like a source of contention with me. I'm not sure that it still is now, but that was like an old point I would always bring up. But it it's kind of like in the Halloween movies, right? Michael Myers' mask gets progressively worse the further yeah. into the series they go with those originals. Well, it's the same with Freddy's makeup. Yep. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> I do like his mask though in Halloween Kills. I think it's I badass. Too. Oh no, absolutely I meant in terms of like the oh, first yeah. like five. six or yeah. something. Or five or six. There's like a part where it's just blonde. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the blonde one. Yeah. Uh, how Michael Myers went from William Shatner and yeah. you know to, to the Dollar Tree version <laughs> yeah. of the mask. What's um, the wait, what's the Halloween movie where like they clearly used really bad CG to put his mask on. Is that H2O? I, believe H2O. It is. I think it's H2O. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I never, somehow I never noticed that till I was watching something on YouTube. One of the horror guys I watched and I was like, Oh, is that real? I had to go check the movie. And sure enough, it was, it looks awful. Yeah. What yeah. happened that it was so bad that they had to digitally put on. They had to go back and mask. shoot that scene. And yeah. the mask had a, a, I think it was, it got dyed pink or something. Something fucked up happened. And during a reshoot, they just did it and CGI'd it in. And it's like, ooh, you could have just left that out. Well, that, that was the problem, terrible. right? With the, the continuity between all of those original films was that they didn't know it was going to be a hit. So then they yeah. either lost it or it was destroyed or damaged. Yeah. And then yep. it just kept happening because they were like, well, this has to be the last one. And then they're like, <laughs> fuck it. So Paul, awesome. Rudd, Paul Rudd's going to be in this one, whatever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Now, I want to get your guys' opinion on this because I just had a conversation about this yesterday. They remake A Nightmare on Elm Street today. Who is it that you want to see play Freddy Krueger if it's not Robert England? Jay says, I think Neil Patrick Harris all day. And we had this conversation yesterday, me and Jay, where Neil Patrick Harris actually has a lot of the same characteristics as Robert England. For me, though, and I know people are going to laugh, I would love to see Devin Sawa play Freddy Krueger. Who's that? I think he, the, uh, oh, the cat from Salt Lake City Punk. 
Casper. Um, Casper. <laughs> From Final Destination, the uh, the main yeah, the Final main guy. Destination. He's in the new yeah. Chucky series. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Oh. No. I'd love to see him play Chuck. Or t- you said Chucky. I'd love to see him play Freddy. You got anybody? I mean, I would like to see Devin Sawa too. Yeah, I'm sure you would. <laughs> what about you, Jay? Um, you know, it's the type of thing where it's like you mentioned Heath Ledger earlier. Yeah. I'm open for. I'm ne- I'm never that person that necessarily has somebody in mind or is like willing to shoot down other people's like yeah. suggestions and things like that. Cause I'm like, what do I know? Like this could, that could be a role that somebody that is unlikely to be in a role like that. Like somebody like Neil Patrick Harris or somebody to that yeah. extent is like, who's to say they won't thrive in a role like that and bring this sort of like eccentric uh, nature to that role. I think that that could be awesome. So yeah. I don't know. I'm open to anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Daniel says Daniel Day Lewis. Oh well, God! Imagine I would, that you got. Like I would, some yeah. I would hate to see how like, meta, how uh, meta he gets into the role or method rather. That would be sick, um, dude. So we are now up to number five, and we're starting with Jay. We are halfway through the list now. Jay, what's going on with you? So my number five is going to be Glenn's death, the bloody geyser from uh, the original. That was one that stood out to me for throughout all of the films. Right? It's kind of this one that, on one hand, it is a scene that just like defies reality in its construction, right? The idea that he's getting sucked into the bed, which as a little kid was always a nightmare of mine, taking him back to the, uh, the waterbed scene that also like terrified me, but getting eaten from by your bed and then just Wes Craven taking it 10 steps further and having this horrific geyser of blood shooting to the ceiling. Also, it's one that's like tied to nostalgia for me because like I showed my grandmother that movie like five years ago, she'd never seen it and she loves Johnny Depp. And so (laughs) That's not awesome. telling her yeah. not telling her what was in store for him i was like oh yeah he's great he's got this very like pivotal role and he's got this like great hero arc and then kind of just like baiting her into that and seeing this actor she loves uh get consumed and then regurgitated in the most horrific of fashion was that's awesome jay rewarding in so its own sense full of life full of blood <laughs> i have to say though falling asleep um, with a like 30 pound boob tube tv on your lap is yeah kind of a kind of a wild move yeah interesting yeah move. <laughs> the belly Kevin shirt says, also um, an interesting move pull a random no preconception someone who loves the role and knows freddie is a diehard that would be fine with me too yeah. um so what's your number five what's halfway through your list josh okay i have grady's death from two and obviously mm. um it's not so much of the way Grady was killed, but how Freddie revealed himself through Jesse's body. I mean, it's fucking ill and awesome and really creative. And you can, you know, it's like somewhat dated now, I guess, but like, I love the practical effects. I love the eyeball and the throat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I think Grady, what his dad's on the other side of the door and the knives, the, the, the yeah. blades come through the door. That's all well and good. I'll take that. But really it's about Freddie literally coming out of Jesse's body. And the one thing that plays, your eyes are fixed on Freddie coming out, but the, 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 like, I guess whatever they call it, like a, a model or whatever of, of Jesse going like, this is really the only part of that, that looks kind of dated to me, but I appreciate it for that. I appreciate it for its practical effects and like what went into that um, to pull that off. So that's my number five. And I think it's a worthy number five. It's up there for me. I think it's a great scene in a really, now that it's all said and done, hopefully not, but basically, but two is a unique movie, man. Two yeah. is a unique ride. There's not another entry in the series like it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that scene is kind of the peak of the mountain for me. When Freddie yeah. fucking comes out of Jesse, it's really ill. They made a whole well, documentary I, I, about it. Yeah. yeah I right? take it that came out scene last year. over, awesome. you know, the CGI scenes from the remake. Like I, that's one thing about the remake that I didn't like is like when he's coming through the wall and it looks all like stops, dude. Like, yeah, Yeah. you're gonna do CG. Like you can use CG and make it breathtaking. That shit felt ultra phoned into me. And I'll go one step further, dude. I don't think that actor did that bad of a job. I actually like some of the, this isn't gonna hurt one bit. It was darker, but like, his makeup, they just, they missed the mark. It didn't look yeah. quite as mm. good as I wanted it to, but I thought the actor did a good job with it. Well, that was the least of my problems with that. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, well, which is saying a lot. It's almost an impossible task to replace Robert England. Literally. Yeah. That's what I was just going to say. I liked what he did. That That's not why I don't like that movie. Right. For me, it's a lot of the CGI. The CGI is really what ruined that film for me. Because yeah, dude, I have to be at too, Nightmare but... on Elm Street and the practical effects and how great the practical effects in the original Nightmare is, and then you take those exact same practical effects and you make them CG, it looks 10 times shittier. So I agree. My, I'm with you. Yeah, my number five. I'm going to finally be the one to break it down. Welcome to primetime, bitch. That came in at number five <laughs> for me. Um, and there's nothing really more I can say that hasn't been said about this, but um, I've talked to Josh about this as well. My wife knows this. You know, growing up as a kid for me, um, whenever I'd, like, play video games and shit, you know, I'd get to an end boss, and I'd be like, welcome to primetime, bitch. Like, oh, that's shit. how much that affected me. So, yeah, number five for me is definitely Jennifer. Welcome to primetime. What about you, love? Um, number five for me is from Freddy's Dead, Carlos, the hearing aid. Mm -hmm. Um, you already, I mean, you already talked about it, but it's, it's a cool kill. Um, I like how he puts the Q-tip all the way through his brain yeah, and like that, that, that. that didn't kill him, but, and then he got, he gets like the super hearing, hearing aid and yeah. And he plays with them and drops the pins and yeah. scratches the board. Oh, I can't he scratches the board like the that. Q -tip. The Q -tip. So great. Yeah. Yes. Oh. And he's like, oh. it's making my yeah. making my fucking skin crawl just doing yeah. that, Josh. Sorry. Hey, I want to show you guys something. Look yeah. how much I love that scene with Grady from part two. Check this out. Can you see that? Oh, that's oh, awesome. There you go. <laughs> that's dope. There's Is that from your guy? Now. Your uh I assume it's from your whoever's been doing your uh models or yeah, yeah, Devil's replicas the, rather. Devil's latex. Yeah. And then I have this Freddy glove from this steel maker in Canada. Oh, so. um, they're real knives they scream like you can make them screech and uh pretty cool pretty neat that's stuff. sick and in, in the chat jay just said the subtext of the whole grady death and what it represents just makes that kill so great and unique and i agree with that that's a part of the thing mr death sure. says i love the hearing aid carlos kill i think we all do that's one that we all yeah. enjoy Absolutely. his head explodes <laughs> Um, so Jay, oh, that's, that's it. We're done with that. We're up to number four. Yep. Josh, you want to start us with your number four, yep. brother? Let me get over to my list real quick. I just wanted to show you guys those toys. Um, I love that, right. dude. I love the finger one. Oh yeah. Isn't that fucking sick, dude? Oh, yeah, I love that thing. When that guy makes devil's latex. Like check out his website on Instagram. He just yeah. dishes out ridiculous stuff. Dude, before just, we end this, Josh, would you be willing to show off your, uh, uh, Jason goes to hell? But of course, like, <laughs> like when he's in the window yeah. right now, scaring you guys got lights there and it yeah. shines down on him, so it just looks like Jason's here. Look real quick, hold on, hold on. When I, I had Josh, yeah, I when I had Josh on Daily Horror Habit, he did the interview with that thing next to him, and that was so yeah. fucking sick. That like, oh yeah, that's yeah, awesome. that was awesome. So, uh, it just I so I have him propped up on this case, and it just looks like Jason's lurking in the window. <laughs> That's and awesome. it's right up against the window. So when you're outside in the lawn and I have all these lights up here shining down, I got to put batteries in them. It just looks so ill, dude. It's so yeah. tight. Thank but yeah, of course, I'll show you guys that. Um, okay. Number four. Can you love this? Roach Motel. There we go. Uh, the Dream Master. Fucking awesome, dude. And I, I'm better now, but I have a thing with bugs. Like, I don't... Mm. I went camping with my wife one time and it, the cicadas were out. This is years ago. <laughs> I had to sleep in the car with like my socks pulled up over my pants. And like, just, I sometimes bugs to me, like on the right, it's gotta be the right day. I don't know if the stars are aligned a certain way or the, uh, the right amount of calories, something. And I just cannot hang. Um, when I was a kid, have you guys ever heard of a Dobson fly? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, no. they're so Ill. Yeah, the damn things are about six inches long. Well, one landed on my porch as a kid, and no one knew what it was. We had to call like a pretty famous biologist, like a guy who had many books out, and he was like, I "I'm shocked that it's here." Like mm. they were coming up, and uh, okay. we were like one of the first people to find one in New York. We're not around water at all, and it was huge. We thought like clearly this is some bug that flew through toxic waste or something. Right. Um, Years later, maybe three or four years later, I'm standing outside my parents' house, same place, and one it lands on my shoulder, and it's so heavy. It's like 
the damn thing is so big, dude. It's like you feel the weight of it land on your shoulder. I couldn't go outside for like three days. That kill. I would have cried. Like, oh, dude, I think I did. Here I am, like a man trying to be one. I'm like 15 years old, <laughs> screaming. <laughs> ah! Oh God, thinking about it right now. My wife thinks I'm such a baby with this stuff. Like, but I'll also at the same time, like I'll find a bug in the house and pick it up on a paper towel and bring it outside because, like, mm-hmm. I'm better now than I used I to be. But I don't that kill. Oh. Yeah, well, bugs, you know. Ugh, ugh, ugh. I, live in the I country, can just picture. So better fucking get over it. But like, I'm better now. But that kill really tapped into like the core of talk about like you know looking. Oh, and then when yeah. Freddie, you check in, but you can't check out, <laughs> and then crushes it and all the green gook. But dude, when she turns in to the roach, it's so awesome. And again, these practical effects. So, I mean, I know yes. this wasn't in the dawn and, or the age of computers. Man, that's a great kill. That's a no. great kill. I can just picture that uh, Dobson fly landing on the porch and Josh being like, is that fucking Jeff Goldblum? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. serious. Oh, yo. Look I have that up. in my notes. They're, you won't believe that these things exist. I show them to people. I just looked it up. I just showed Ashley a picture of one. They're fucking huge. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're massive. They're so ill. They're so <laughs> ill. But that's kind of why that kill is so money for me. I, and that's why it's so high on the list. It's creative. It's really cool. Um and I thought you'd like that, Ken. Oh, yeah. We may talk about it again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Jay says, Josh got the kind of room I wish I could have. Josh has some dope shit, man. Yeah, like He really does. Look, I know that people talk about Josh because he's an amazing drummer and he's an amazing rapper. But, dude, his horror knowledge is fucking sick. And the things he has right. is so right. fucking cool. Uh, Mr. Death Breath says, hey, Jay, Dad, I'm, we're so glad to have you guys here. Um, Nene says, do y'all think Rob Zombie is capable of directing and writing a good nightmare movie? I think he would be just fine at directing it. I would hate to see Rob Zombie dialogue in a Freddy Krueger movie. Yes. I wouldn't want him to write it. Yep. Yeah. We feel I'd the like to see him direct that. one. Yeah. But writing, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I'm with you guys. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I never want to limit somebody's art, but yeah, I would be concerned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's literally the nicest way you could put that, Josh. I love it. Yeah. I'm a nice guy, Jay. <laughs> so uh, number four for me was talked about Glenn. Uh, Johnny Depp, the waterbed scene. This is why Joey made an honorable mention because this death to me is just so fucking sick, man. And Mm. you get to see, like you said, the blood. And this was all done practically on such a small budget. And Wes and his crew made it work so well. Um, And one thing, I don't know if you guys ever noticed this, but the blonde chick in Scream, she's wearing that same cutoff jersey that Mm -hmm. Johnny Depp wore from Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, shit, I never noticed that. Yeah, and, like, the the little homages that, you know, Wes paid to Nightmare on Elm Street with Scream was just so sick, man. That's cool. um, Jay just said, hold up, Josh is is Josh the drummer from Coheed? Yes, he (laughs) fucking is, man. And I don't think people get it, man. Coheed is so influential to me. I have the Iron Fist tattooed right here. Yeah, right on, man. That's all. It makes me so happy. That's awesome. Yeah, like the, these guys. I met Josh um, in person for the very first time way back when they were doing the Second Stage Turbine Blade tour, and they hit the shelter in Detroit, Michigan, with the Rocking Horse Winner, One oh, Line God. Drawing, and Hope's Fall. And me, Josh, and Quam kicked it all night. So it was a really, really bad snowstorm outside. And we just sat there kicking it all night, talking. It's one of my favorite memories, man. Literal yeah, lifetime ago, dude. A dude, I'm looking. You know, I'm ago. hanging out with these people, you know, and you know, just fucking that I've looked up to my whole life. And it's just that, that's a night that I've remembered my whole life. Um, that's cool, man. That's awesome, Ken. Yeah, Mr. Death Breath says I have to agree. Ken, uh, Death's death is iconic and unforgettable. Jay says, dude, much respect for your talent on the skins. Obviously, the man. <laughs> Um, and then Ashley says, Josh is the best, always full of energy. I'm so excited every time we get to hang out. This means the world to me. Um, do you want to give your number four, my love? Yeah. Um, my number four is from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, and it's Sheila's death. Um, I You already talked about this one also, mm-hmm. but I just like how he sucks out all the air in her lungs, and she just is flat, and then in, like you pan over to real life and she's choking and mm-hmm. they're trying to give her her inhaler to revive her. It's like, he sucked out all the air. It's <laughs> awesome. I like when her eye goes white, like at yeah. the very end. Yeah. I'm actually ashamed that that's not on my list, dude. Like I, I, I did like consider it. It's written down like four times, but I, that's an oversight on my end. Um, I should have, 
had that on my list. It's a great kill. That that's yeah. an oversight on mine. Yeah. Well, that death has an ending that I love, which is the quality of a lot of those deaths where it's in the re- like the real world. It's explainable why she died. Right. There's a couple yeah. of them throughout the series where it's just like you couldn't explain that. Like we mentioned, I think it was uh, Grady's death when Freddie gets birth and the father can like literally see the claws coming through it. And it's like you can't really yeah. explain that. Not to yeah, that death, but it's like yeah. I always appreciate that where they're able to sort of like mask the mystery yeah. of it, whereas it's not just like the teens being like, "Well, Freddie did it," and the parents actually have a re- or the adults rather have a real world reasoning for why this person died. Like I don't know, it's it, it the right. explanation for it. I don't know. I always appreciate that instead of it just being like, "Well, it's magic." Well, you but, guys talk about how like Freddie, um, he kind of goes after like you know like the person and what's going on with them, and she had mm. asthma, so he sucks out all her air. Yeah, so. and also what he says, right? I mean, he's like he's picking on the the like perceived nerdy girl and saying like you want to suck face. Like the, yeah. per- per- the perception of her in that movie is that she's like the nerdy outsider girl, right? right? And yeah. the way she's portrayed in that, you wouldn't assume that she's had an experience like that. So the fact that Freddie is choosing that way to kill her is like very intentional and mm-hmm. even more again like the word i keep coming back to insidious and sinister yeah. it really is um charles just said in keeping secrets just had a birthday we do have another coheed fan here that is true it did and uh, um that's the oh man she was death yeah. is brutal josh before we go back to the list real quick because we're up to our number threes i gotta tell the story real quick when in keeping secrets came out if you went and bought the album the opening day it came out, you got a free T-shirt that came with it, um, a special limited edition T-shirt that came with the in-, in Keeping Secrets record. Me and a bunch of my friends drove all the way to Detroit because that's the only record store we could find anywhere near us. Yeah, we were a small band. Yeah, but um, yes. that was and- a moment I'll never forget in my life. Like we were a small band on a small label that that seven people worked there and six of them said no to signing us. And this one guy named Dan Sanshaw said, I just have this feeling I've reworked some numbers. We have just enough to put this weird band out. And uh, so the first record comes out. We tour, 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 tour. Seems like it's kind of connecting. And then In Keeping Secrets comes out. And Dan tells me, I think we've got a real shot at 10,000 records the first week, which would like be mind blowing. 10,000 records was like the mark of like a real band. And we did 24,000 the first week. And uh, I think I dropped my phone as I got to the movies. I dropped my phone. We were 27 on Billboard, which you got. We're, we're a baby band. We're a brand new band. And uh, In Keeping Secrets, to me, you know, it's like our nightmare one, man. It's like we win. And that's the first record we actually got to make a record. Second stage, Turbine Blade, which might be my favorite one. But it was just a collection of demos. It, we recorded it in a kid's bedroom. Like. Right. in six hours you know it was like and i love it for that but in keeping secrets was the first time we made a real record and uh yeah man it's a really important th- pillar of my life so mm-hmm. um that's cool to hear man that you guys drove to detroit certainly wasn't in every record store i think well, most record stores were like uh, what what's a coheed in a cambria what the, the fuck? The, this is where the story gets sad josh uh, um oh. we get there and the record store had closed down so we uh. drove all the way there and we couldn't get it. We were all heartbroken. And I got to share one more thing before we get back to the list. We're talking about how much Coheed means to me. And she's a witness to this. And a bunch of my friends can attest to this too. Seventh grade, Ken Sledge knew he was going to name his daughter Chloe someday. My, our nine-year-old's name is Chloe because of a misheard Coheed and Cambria lyric. Um, in, in, in Everything Evil. This is before you could just go get lyrics, man. And yeah. I thought at the end of that song, Chloe, oh, saying, oh. Chloe, oh, oh. And ever since I was like, I'm going to name my daughter Chloe. And sure enough, it's Chloe, oh, oh. Yeah, her name's Chloe, oh, oh. No. <laughs> that's awesome. But yeah, that's, that's really, that's, 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 that's the dope, impact dude. you guys have had on my life. I've put you on my skin. I've named my daughter after a misheard lyric. You guys' is music and you as a person mean so much to me. And this is so cool to have you on here, man. Oh, uh, that man, was it's really flattering, moment. brother. I'm, you know, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of you, dude. I, and all these, like, wins and successes you're having light me up dude i couldn't be happier i just want to see my friends do well and that goes it's exactly the same for you jay i really like you guys a lot and uh thank you brother. Real, yeah, really flattered you're, here too, you're gonna make me blush <laughs> <laughs> i'm, I'm soaking all in i get to hang out with two of my favorite uh favorite horror pals and yeah i'm loving yeah, it. It. You guys cool are all right. people, i don't think people understand how much of a connection we have because of horror 
You yeah. know, like well, the, the this is a great example of it, right? Yeah, it's so fucking awesome to sit Dude. and chat with you guys about it, man. Jay, where you live in Massachusetts? Yeah, I'm just outside Boston. Okay, I'm only a couple hours from you, mate. Ken, you're Michigan, like, mm-hmm. yep. dude, we should not way off in the future. We should, in November, get together for a weekend if we can't. I know we're all adults and we have lives. If we can't swing a weekend, at least a night of for sure. watching and just hanging and chilling, we can film something for the shows. <laughs> Be happy to do that. But we should really get together. Not... Hey, maybe one day. Why not in November? I'm off from tour. We can yeah. figure out a time to do it. I'm just saying, yeah. we're going to be in Massachusetts this week. Thursday, I got Friday, a Saturday, Saturday. cruise to go on. Yeah. Huh? I got the Coheed cruise. Fuck. <laughs> well, I tried. But no, we need no, to make for, this happen. Yeah. If we all meet Co- in the middle, I, I'll do whatever it takes. I think No, we, we can go to time. somebody's house, dude. Like, I, I, I'd fucking come pick you up, Jay. We'd drive to fucking Michigan, dude. Like, content, content or not, I'll do it. Do it. <laughs> We'll, yeah, we'll ha- yeah. We, we got the big movie theater projector in our living room, man. We'll just hang out, watch horror movies, and just fucking kick it. Dude, there I would go. do that. I'm saying, like, I would do that and do whatever it was in my power to do that. Like, I really enjoy this. You know, there's not a whole lot of people anymore in my life that I get to talk about this stuff with. That's why I'm sitting here at almost damn near 11 o'clock at night, sitting on my movie room floor and enjoying the shit out of it, you know? So yeah. let's talk yeah. about this, guys. We yeah. really should put this together. I'm in. I'm a, and, dude, and, I will okay, I'll come and pick you up, dude. We, and we'll, I'm close to you, I bet. I'm not, not more yeah. than a couple hours from you. No. We're yeah, in the same. Will, we're in the same realm. This is more than possible. We'll definitely yeah. make this happen. Right Soon. after the snow, I'm going to text later. you guys. We're going to set this up, and we're going to do a whole big fucking episode for Daily Horror Habit. We're going to do a whole big episode for Sledgehammer Horror, and we're just going to have an amazing time. Um, Jay says y'all need to get together and go see Scream when it comes out, January fourteenth. I'm in. Um, hey Ken, can't stay long. Thought I'd pop in and say, hey, I finally get to meet the woman of myth, Ashley. Yeah, she's ah. perfect. Um. So Josh did his water uh, number four. I did my number four. Did you do number, your number four, Mom? Yeah, it was Sheila. Yep. Okay, so I we're at number did. four. Yeah, so my number four is uh, Ron's death, which is the, uh, the I dubbed the birthing of Freddie, right? Uh, this one, I just like was watching clips like all like we all were basically before this um, to rehash. And it got me thinking about both, Ken, both of our podcasts. We talked with Josh about uh, his love for an American werewolf in London and this kill really kind of like reminds me of that in that Freddie being birthed is very much sort of like an homage to a werewolf birthing, right? It starts mm-hmm. with him being like, oh man, like it's starting to happen again. And then you just see him like sprouting the blades from his fingers. And then literally his skin falls off and reveals obviously like the Freddie arm that's flayed. And then of course he literally like bursts from his stomach to go mm-hmm. then kill, uh, kill Ron. And I just yeah. love, like, I thought the practical effects held up well enough for like, the type of kill it was and that it was very like body horror esque, which I'm a huge sucker for body horror movies and yeah. everything. That's probably like my favorite subgenre. So to see that be so heavily uh, like be an influence within that kill, like it makes it stand out more so than the actual like act of the kill, right? It's more about the transformation leading up to it that uh, really resonates with me. And it's one of those things that it's like, once you see it once you can't like stop thinking about it just yeah. because of like, the reality that the the evil is coming within to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wait, but yeah. Who's Ron? Uh, well, his name's isn't it Ron Grady? Oh, I yeah, call Grady because I always I was like, am I? Is this a kill I don't know about? Oh no no no. His, his, the, yeah, so his last name's Grady, but his dad when his dad's banging on the door, Ron, I'm sure he calls him. Totally yeah, he calls right. him. Yeah, he calls yeah, him totally. Ron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I know you I, know. I in no way did I think like, wait a second, I'm about to correct. <laughs> fucking jay no what i thought <laughs> what's the boyfriend's name rob from the first one Team rod. boyfriend rod rod that's rod. it rod. Yeah, 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 i rod. thought you said rod at first and i was like oh no, oh, no, no that's no. an interesting take the birthing of freddie is that the first <laughs> time we see him no what the fuck does he mean i'm an idiot okay we've established i'm an idiot let's move on <laughs> no no you're good because <laughs> when when i go i googled i was googling clips or youtubing clips or whatever and it comes up as uh what is it grady's death but then i looked it up and it was ron because i was like why is his father calling him ron his name's yeah. Grady. Right. yeah so, i totally oh, hear it this off ron, real quick since ron, we were yeah. talking about it check this out uh oh nice oh shit oh that's tight dude. what is that come is it uh what is it called scream something no this was the fright group? rags oh fright rags okay cool yep yeah, that's my, cool. that's my my favorite shirt right now, dude. Stay off the moors. 
Um, yeah, Stay off totally the moors. Sick. Stick to the moors. I just got a sick <laughs> shirt from Cavity Colors. Uh, Friday That's what six, I was thinking. Cavity uh, Colors shirt. Um, where it's got kind of like like an homage of a bunch of the deaths, and Jason's holding the arm of the paintball guy. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I'll show you before we're out. I'll run. Yeah, it's such a great. It's so dope. I love Friday it's so six, happy. man. Um. So up to we're in our top three now, and I do want to say too for people that have joined us late, um, we are going to go back and and when we get to number one. We're going to go from honorable mentions all the way back down to number one right before we give our number ones. But right now we're at our bronze medal, number three. And for me, it's Debbie. When she's working out and then you see her arms break, you're talking about the practical effects of it. Oh. And you see her turning into that cockroach. And then, you know, yeah. Freddie, they check in, but they don't check out. You know, like that, that whole scene. And it grossed me out as a kid. That's another one that really grossed me out as a kid. But even to this day, like if like my son, he's 13. He's really into football, really into weightlifting. I'm always like, dude, don't you be benching by yourself. You'll turn into a fucking cockroach, you know? Like, <laughs> so it's one of those things that, like, it's stuck with me my whole life. So whenever we're, we're working out, I'm always right down there with him when we're benching just so he knows, you know, don't break your arms and turn into a cockroach. So um, coming in for number three for me is Debbie. What about you? Um, number three for me is um, from 2010 remake, and it's Nancy's mom at the end where when, he goes through the mirror and, yeah, sucks her goes through her eyeballs or whatever that's pretty cool and gory and <laughs> and, I, and i like the blood yeah <laughs> what about you jay uh my number three is going to be debbie's uh death the roach motel <laughs> First, it's like the my two biggest fears right is one is like body horror and that i'm gonna have like a transformation that's very uh very reminiscent to the fly right you kind of just like being your skin falls off and then the monster in the insectoid monster is uh, revealed. But also like you just said, Ken, like, right. Like when I used to work out all, like pre pandemic for uh, all the COVID shit, like when I was going to the gym constantly, it was like benching by yourself and the idea that you could overload and then not have a spot. Like that beginning part of that is super terrifying. And of course yeah. it's extrapolated in the beginning where like, obviously her elbows then are ripped off of their, uh, their frame basically like that's terrifying. And then the body horror element, that's one that, I, and of course you have Freddie's uh, thing where he says at the end, what is it? Uh, you check in, you don't check out. Like yeah. Yeah. that's one of the things that it's just like the perfect sort of Freddie cherry on top of a kill. 100%. And obviously I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, Josh, before yours, Jay says, just hearing these lists really makes you appreciate the Nightmare on Elm Street series sticking to practical effects as much as they did. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this list with these guys because of their appreciation for a nightmare on Elm street. Um, so what comes in at number three for you, Josh? I'm going to tell you, but real quick, let me show you the shirt real quick. Okay. Um, check this out. Hold up one second. Okay, here we go. Okay. So check this shirt out, dude. Oh, very oh cool. Gosh. Yeah. That's that bad like, as fuck. It really pops in real life. Like it's, I don't know if it translates on the camera, like it, the colors are so sick. And then you can see you got like a bunch of the deaths from, and then you got the paintball guy down here and Jason's holding his arm. Yeah. DJ Graham is Jason with the tool belt, the gloves, the whole nine. Love that that's shirt. Cool. Okay. Yeah, very cool. Coming in number three, I have Tina's death from nightmare mm. one. Um, Totally classic, obviously. Um, I'm always taken back by just how bloody it is. Yes. Uh, take your, transport yourself back to when you're first time watching this. And this woman's getting dragged up and down the scene. Like something out of this world, something clearly supernatural is happening. And, and her boyfriend is screaming, Dina, Dina, right? She's screaming. She's got to be awake. And the music, da 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 and like you, you kind of see the cuts happen. There's so much blood, and as she's dragged, the blood is all over the walls. It left an impact. It's a classic Freddy kill. It's an old school Freddy kill. When she lands and the blood just hits Rod, and he's like, what? and he, remember he's yelling, "I'll kill you, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> I'll kill you, motherfucker! Who's doing this?" <laughs> but man, what a great! I mean, iconic, awesome. At top notch it could be honestly dude you could tomorrow up that one could be number one to me like yeah. these are kind of mm. interchangeable in a way today that's my number three and what you just said something you just said that i want to bring up earlier jay you were talking about how insidious he is right here at this moment 
he's not only doing this to Tina, but he's doing it to Rod as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, because he, he, he leaves Rod alone there in that moment. You know, and it, it could be because well, he's awake and Tina's sleeping, what have you. But at the same time, it's just like he knows what he's doing at this moment. He is making her go up that wall over over to the bed just so he could torture Rod even more. Well, that's the same thing with the uh, the Freddy being birthed uh, kill that I referenced for my, uh, what was it? It was number four. Like at the end of all of that, not only does this guy get killed and his parents have the realization that he's dead after seeing those claws come through the door, it, who's set up as being the killer? It's Jesse, right? Because then he's covered in blood. And not only that, he's wearing... The fucking Freddy, uh, the Freddy knife glove. So yeah. it's it's not only just that people are getting killed, but also somebody else is about to take the rap for it unless yeah. they can prove the unprovable a lot of the time. Right. Um, so before we get into number two, catch up real quick. I think I blocked Tina's death out of my head as a kid, freaked me out. <laughs> Jay Depp is here. All out. What's up, buddy? Hey, nice Jay to Depp. see you, Jay. Um, so now we are going to get into our number two, our silver medal. So you want to start this one, my love? Yeah, so number two for me is Welcome to Prime Time, bitch. Um, <laughs> that we nice. all just made in the yeah, cycle. I, I love that kill. Um, I don't know if it's so much for the kill as it is for his witty one-liner. Um, but it's Pretty memorable. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good kill. And um, and I like that, you know, he, um, he Improv. improvised it. Yeah. So I think that was awesome. Yeah, I, I, I fucking love it, too. Like, I can't disagree with yeah. you. <laughs> So what about you, Jay? What's coming in number two for you? Uh, for me, it's going to be Philip's death, the uh, the puppet show, if you will, from Dream Warriors. That was, again, one that I got introduced to from one of those, like, hundred scariest moments. And that was one where it's, like, without any context, you're just immediately confused but also terrified, right? Because he's using, like, his tendons as the marionette strings. Yeah. But something that I wanted to bring up earlier was that there's sort of the visceral reaction to the gore and the gruesomeness of that scene, like literally being led around by your tendons, but it's more so about the end of it, the end of that scene, right? Where he's fallen. And what happens is that the medical professionals, of course, in that place always assume that it's a suicide, right? Yeah. But I think that that is an interesting moment because it shows like this dichotomy that has always been in horror where it's like the young people versus the old people, if you will, right? And it kind of just shows like a lack of empathy because like what do the doctors in that place who are supposed to be professionals say? Like they call him a coward. I think that they, I think they call him a coward. Uh, coward, and it's an empty thing to do in a room full of people that like have formed a somewhat of a bond or a friendship with him. And I don't know. That has always been an interesting element because that sort of tug and pull conflict between the teens or the young adults and and the adults themselves has always been a theme of not only nightmare on the stream but like horror in general right that sort of give yeah. and take and i think that that scene is it hits in a way that not a lot of the kills do because i think we've been talking this long now like two hours now about the kills and a lot of the reasons for that has been like the creativity or the gore but that kill always stands out as like being pretty heartbreaking in a way because yeah it's one of those that could be it's I don't know. I always look at horror kills in a way where it's like, okay, yeah, from a genre standpoint, that's terrifying. But then from a, a human standpoint, it's heartbreaking in a way because you see like the ramifications and yeah. the justifications and the way that people react to this thing that seems as if it was normal when obviously we didn't know it was very supernatural and uh, the cause of why this person died. Right. And I love the fact that you're going a little deeper there because that's going to come up here in a little bit too. Um, Nene says Nightmare on Elm Street might have the best kills of any franchise, certainly the most creative. That's what I appreciate the most. Yeah. I'll go out to say I completely agree. I think Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Friday the 13th was always my favorite franchise. I think Nightmare on Elm Street definitely has the best kills. Freddy definitely wins when it comes to the creativity and the darkness of his kills. Um, what about you, Josh? Number two. Well, don't look for me to be quite as eloquent and articulate as my man Jay. I have uh, Philip Puppet as number two as well. Um, you know, Jay, you bring up a good point. And what, what struck, uh, many good points, what struck me is maybe that's why as kids, like horror speaks to kids for that kind of, mm. you know, young people versus old people aesthetic that plays throughout. Um, but it is heartbreaking. Um, yeah. And I mean, Kincaid gets upset in the group meeting afterwards. Yeah. He couldn't hack it. So he took a plunge, you know, and it was like, but it was hard for you liked Philip already. Philip yeah. was cool, man. 
Um, and God, what a great job by the movie to like, you care about these kids. I mean, three is a fantastic movie. Like yeah, I yeah. love three. Yes. It's entertaining. But for me, like I care about these kids and I want to mm-hmm. see these kids win. And by golly, they almost give it to us, man. Like the kids fight back. They're fucking awesome. Yeah. I love three. Um, I'm going to stop there. Cause you just kind of blew my mind. That was some deep shit. And I think you're really, <laughs> Oh, it's my dog. I just got scared. I heard some noises behind me. <laughs> oh, my dog. Um, yeah, that was really great, Jay. You're a okay. smart fellow, man. That was really awesome. That was awesome. Again, I appreciate that, man. That's what I love about these two. <laughs> educate each other. Um, slow. Uh, is it Sion? Dark Elm Street Lover Boy is a great song. I agree. I fucking love that tune. Um, now let's go with my number two, which is Tina. From the original. Um, when you get to the Tina kills, that's one of the, well, what I was saying earlier. That's why I didn't want to go too deep into it, but we're talking about how they affect other people. You got Rod right there suffering with her, you know, and then the next day he's hiding in the bushes like, I didn't do it, Nancy. I swear I didn't do it, which should be obvious because she has blood streaks going up the wall into the ceiling. But what else are you going to do at that moment? Yeah, I never thought um, of that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it literally kills him. You know, he goes and then he sleeps in the jail. And I had somebody on the podcast that talked about a nightmare on Elm Street and how they couldn't sleep with sheets on their bed because mm-hmm. the rod kill in the jail with the sheet wrapping around and hanging no them shit. Them so bad that they Damn. could not sleep with sheets on their bed for years. Oh. And um, yeah, I know that bothers you. Yeah. That's like nails on a chalkboard for her. No sheets on the bed. That's a wrap. But with, with Tina's death also, you know, when you get that close up, of finally cutting into her skin and the blood boiling up over and everything was done practically on such a great small budget, but it looks so fucking fantastic. And that yeah. movie, especially that death, it, it's gotta be it. Like I said, it had to be in my top 10. It's all the way up to number two. So for me, it's that one. Um, so that is everybody's number two. Let's catch up on the chat real quick before we get to number ones. Devin says, can't wait for the number ones. Well, here they come. Jay says, got to go in a minute. Just wanted to thank y'all for a great stream, great conversation, good vibes, and even better people. You can't go wrong with that. Much love and stay safe. Jay, you're always here. We appreciate you so much, man. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah, it means a lot to all of us. It really does. Um, So now, Jay, you're going to start us with number one. But before you give your number one, if you wouldn't mind, go from your honorable mentions and then all the way down to number one, my friend. So my honorable mention was uh, Arch Thompson, you know, her getting killed at the very end of the original and kind of just that coming out of nowhere for me as a kid and just being like, oh, shit, nobody is safe until literally the credits roll. So that was sort of uh, not the most memorable kill, but more like my visceral reaction to it. Uh, Ten was Taryn in Dream Warriors with the needles. Um, Joey in the waterbed from Dream Master was number nine. I had uh, Sheila's death and getting the life literally sucked out of her uh, as number eight. Number seven was uh, Primetime Bitch, which was uh, very memorable to this day. Number six was uh, Freddy's death in the Dream Master, getting to kind of see all of his different victims sort of like getting their comeuppance finally after how many years of him doing what he does. Uh, I had Glenn's death as number five, the blood geyser. Who can forget that? Number four was Ron's death, the uh, or... uh, Grady's death, the uh, birthing of Freddy. Uh, number three was Debbie's death, the Roach Motel. A fantastic display of practical work. Uh, number two was Philip's death, the puppet show, which was as uh, gruesome as it was heartbreaking. And then my number one would be Tina's death in the sort of levitating. And something that Ken has mentioned uh, twice now, I think, was sort of how it affects the boyfriend. And of course, it is Tina being murdered. But at the same time, like the heartbreaking angle of that, other than this young woman being murdered is the realization that the boyfriend now is going to essentially be like convicted of this persona that others attribute to him. Right. He's sort of viewed as this scumbag bad boy and his worst nightmare has finally come true in that, like he's being framed for something that he might be a little rough around the edges. He might live this sort of uh, a lifestyle that's not necessarily in tune with the, uh, the uh, sort of like HOA lifestyle of this suburban neighborhood, but (laughs) At the end of the day, like he's not a murderer and to see somebody be falsely convicted of that and then essentially have Freddy Krueger be the, uh, the jury, the judge, jury and executioner is like the sort of heartbreaking bookend to that. But also I think just like, again, talking about 
the fact that they were able to pull that kill off and it still blows my mind. Like I'm Josh earlier mentioned um, uh, the movies that made us, I think is the title of the documentary. Like yeah. I want to go back and rewatch that just so that I can hear again, how they brought that scene to life because no matter how many times I read or hear about how they filmed that scene of her dancing up the sides of the wall and there's this blood everywhere and everything. I mean, it's, it's an incredible feat. And to think about how micro budget, this movie was and how impactful it ended up being as a result of that. I mean, it's some, it's, it's no wonder why we're, we've just talked now for almost two and a half hours about the entire franchise and how it made such an impact with so, so few kills in the very first entry of it, that it not only spawned a franchise, but it would sort of become more creative and it would become more impressive in some regards. But I mean, you can't get better than the original. There's right. a limited number of kills, but the kills are so pristine and still so impactful all these years later. I yeah. completely agree. It's, you know, the first film is the definition of quality over quantity. Mm. Um, and the quality of the kills throughout the first movie are perfect. Hey, uh, Josh, Devin says the first time he met Robert England, he wore his weird science shirt. Oh, with me as Freddie? Yeah, that's fucking sick. Dude. I'm Freddie on the shirt. It's I'm <laughs> Robert England, and we took some of his characteristics but I got the big glasses on and I'm holding the Freddy. We did a whole horror theme. We did a local show. We did the Halloween, the night he came home. You know, I wish that I had like incorporated the horror stuff earlier on into weird science when I was young and hungry, almost did like an ice nine kills thing. Like that would have yeah. been really up my alley. And like, um, but yeah, I like making cool shirts with my favorite horror movie characters now, but you know, Speaking of, of Tina's death, you know, it's also Freddie's first kill that we're privy to, you know, yeah. like that's the first. And I'm just like, as, as we're talking, you know, I'm, ta I'm taking back to my first viewing and I don't, I was so young. I might've been five, dude, when I first saw that movie, which is crazy. I know, but like, it was shocking, you know, and even the scene, which I, it probably looks a little dated where she pulls his on his face and his whole face comes off and it's just the skull and he's like mm. <laughs> you know <laughs> it's a little cheese but like take yourself back to we don't know freddy krueger is not freddy krueger we don't know what he is we're just right. learning about him right. um and it was fucking horrifying man i remember early on and it had to be my first viewing just being like glued but i wanted to look away it was like and i'm not horrified very easy i love horror movies i love my jason movies and and all that stuff. And and I just remember the feeling of like, this is different. This is shocking. This is brutal, the amount of blood. That's why I brought up the amount of blood. Like, you know, I'm probably the softest I've ever been now. But like as a kid, it just, it, it, I always I kind of overuse this. It lit me up. And that's really, I think you It just lit me on fire. And Tina's a really worthy number one, brother. Like I said, tomorrow that could be my number one. Mm -hmm. Um. Is it my turn to go down the list? Yep. I, I have so much one. scribbling and writing all over. You guys have brought up so many like really powerful points. I'm like trying to write them down on my list. Um, but I think I got it. Number 10 was Dan. Uh, Need for Speed from Nightmare 5. Not one of my favorite entries uh, in the series. But I did think that that was – it had some memorable kills and they show up here late in my list. Uh, number 9, also from 5, was The Feeding Frenzy, uh, Greta. <laughs> Um, you know, I didn't want to get like too deep before. I, I think one of the reasons that kill really sticks for me is like, um, you know, I was like chubby in school. I look back at pictures now. I wasn't even I was the same size as all my other friends, but I always got called fat a lot. And I had some, like, I still do. I still battle with like these weird kind of food hangups. Um, and I think that kill really stuck with me for that reason, even if it was right. on a subconscious, I mean, I'm aware of this, but like, when that movie came out, I wasn't mature enough to really kind of articulate that even in my own psyche, in my own mind. Sure. But that kill really did stick with me. And she's got this like overbearing mother and um, Greta. I just, I do love that kill, even though it's wrapped in a movie that I'm not really super duper down with. Uh, my number eight was uh, Julie. That's her name, right? Julie, the babysitter, the throwback mm. to the yes. Disney kill in yep. New Nightmare. Uh Number seven, I had, this is a, this is one of the standouts. I, it's not mentioned by anybody else. So I kind of, that's me broadening the scope. I have the, the, the pool scene, uh, more for the, you're all my children now, to, right. which to me is iconic. It's dark, Freddie. There's no kill in that sequence. That's 
all that great. But Ken brought up a tremendous point. That's the only time in the series that Freddie just goes on a barrage. Yeah. He's in the yeah. real world and he's at your fucking pool party and he brought the ruckus, <laughs> y'all. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, that's my number. My number six is Welcome to Prime Time. Uh, we've talked at great length about that iconic scene. Like I said, tomorrow that could be my number three. I mean, that's just that's a top tier pillar kill yeah. in the Nightmare series. Uh, number seven, number six for me was Grady, um, uh, where Freddie comes out of Jesse's body and somebody got the the eye in the throat. So many great parts of that kill that scene. Uh, number four, Roach Motel, Dream Master, Heebie Jeebies. We talked about that. We love that. Number three was Tina. I just want to mention it one more time. That could be my number one tomorrow. Uh, number two was my Philip puppet. Again, we talked about all these. And we all, this, what, the greatest part about this is all having the same ones. It, anytime I can like gather a deeper insight or a different perspective on these movies that I hold so dear to my heart. You can yeah. sign me up, and, and it's been uh, in no short supply tonight, and I really thank you guys for that, man. This has been, like, really awesome. Uh, number one, Glenn, for me. No big surprise there. Mm-hmm. Iconic, awesome. That uh, Movies that made us shed some light on the actual mm-hmm. practical effects and how they did it with the spinning room. Mm-hmm. Have you, you guys haven't seen that yet? No. I haven't seen I that one. Oh, I saw so the other good. entries. Dude, We've all like seen so many behind the scenes things, and some of it's probably like elementary to you guys. I know you guys are for real horror buffs, but there's shit about that scene that I had no idea. Uh, somebody got electrocuted, not yep. ultra seriously, but there's like, all kinds of stuff that happened. The light is actually the light that looks like this one up here is mm. live. So when all that blood is hitting it, it had electrified and it's up into the tanks, and somebody got zapped. And the room was spinning and like the weight of all that fake blood kept the room spinning. They couldn't stop it. So they're trying to turn it back this way. Check it out on Netflix. Yeah, they do. for sure. Friday the 13th, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street. And oddly enough, at the end, Elf. And I love Elf. And that was a really good one. I watched that on the way home from the city yesterday. So Glenn's death is my my first one. Can you bring up, uh, Ken, you had mentioned this, uh, quality over quantity. But like Tina's death continued to haunt. I mean, how great the scenes when she's calling out to Nancy in the body bag. In the body bag, yes. Oh, so sick. That could have been somehow an honorable. I mean, that's another iconic scene. And she's being dragged down the hallway. They already established a quirkiness with the girl in the hallway with the red and green sweater yeah. like you got on. Where's your hall pass? Screw your hall pass. And yep. Nancy keeps walking. Nancy. And it's Freddie. There's leaves blowing in the hallway and shit. Why? I have no idea. But... It's just like a quirkiness going back to the red and green top on the car. It's already kind of been established. The red and green top is silly, Ken. Like I, I like half of me gets it, dude. I also don't like it, but it's like just seems blasphemous to me to say that. But like I, I do fully get it. Um, so that's my list. That's my top ten, yeah. baby. Woo! Awesome. I mean, I do. If you guys never noticed this, when Rod and Tina are in the bed making love, the throw blanket that they have over top of them is red and green as well. No shit. Oh shit! <laughs> I never noticed. Never that. noticed. Never noticed. Yeah. And it, it, I, I just recently learned this. This is something I just learned. In the basement, when she pulls out Freddie's glove, they had a scene there where she talked about how Freddie had killed Nancy's sibling when he was Fred Krueger, mm. and that's the reason that they were so hard, and that's why she kept his glove because that's the glove that killed her first child. Oh and, shit! And also, why she's so like overbearing with the bars? An, an alcoholic, and, yeah. an alcoholic, yeah. Oh I, shit, dude! I never heard that. Wow. Yeah, I'll send you the link on YouTube so you can check that out, Josh. It's it's powerful, man. No, yeah. that's dope, dude. I can't yeah. believe I didn't know. I mean, there's always so much stuff with these things. That's cool. Yeah. Shit, cool. Yeah, so Thanks for that, sharing. That, that's awesome. I wanted to share those two scenes with you guys. It's, I didn't know if you noticed those or not, but um, I'll count down. From honorable mention to one. Honorable mentions were Nancy's death in Nightmare 3 just because of the impact it had on me as a kid. And then Joey's waterbed scene from 4. Um, oh, shit. I'm sorry. Marvel- I forgot my honorable mentions. My bad. What was Go ahead. Yours. Same, well, same one. That and <laughs> the mom is the blow-up doll through the window. <laughs> this, this fucking guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Ken. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, 10 for me is Carlos's hearing aid from Freddy's Dead. 9, Greta overfed from Dream Child. 8, Sheila sucked face.
from Dream Master. Seven, Dean Suicide with a Knife from Nightmare on Elm Street 2010. Six, Julie in the Hospital from Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Five, Welcome to Primetime Bitch. Four, Glenn Waterbed. Three, Debbie Workout Cockroach. Two, Tina Wall. And number one, of course. <laughs> gotta be puppet bill and something we haven't really talked about with this scene that i love is during certain shots you see the veins in the arteries and then in other ones you don't and you just see this kid walking through mm. the hallway like oh, this totally, totally. Yeah. the way they cut that scene up to make it so much that sometimes you can see it and sometimes you can't and like we talked earlier the score joey this mute that can't talk running down the hallway slamming just to try to get people awake and get them aware so they can try to stop their friend from being murdered not committing suicide yeah. being murdered yeah. and they're screaming to him and screaming to him and then when you have freddie up there in the cloud he just gives that laugh and <laughs> you know cuts and then he falls like it's just so again we talked about freddie not only killing for the person that he's killing but killing to ruin the people around him he's yeah. toying with them you know much like i don't want to get too much into halloween kills but the stair kill and halloween kills mm. you know he's totally toying with a the person there before yep. he does what he does and Wait, which kill in Halloween Kills? The stairs. We'll just leave it at that. We don't want to spoil anything. Yeah, no. When he, starts, when he starts walking down the stairs. The head twist. Oh, shit. Okay. God, yeah. I only watched it once. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that's, you know, to me, that whole scene was Michael playing with somebody else. And yeah, totally. Yep. Freddie is the one that perfected that playing with somebody. Taking the um, pleasure in their work, right? Yes. And, you know, the, he makes him walk through the whole hospital just to get him up to that bell tower, you know? And like you talked about earlier, how he walks right through that door. Yeah. You know? And it looks good. Like it's done practically, yeah. you know, two camera effect, but it looks good. Like it looks even great. Now, I think, I think it looks true. The whole yeah. scene looks It holds up tremendous. incredibly well. It really yeah, does. I love the stop great. motion Freddy puppet at the beginning, how he cuts and he just jumps down and he's walking across the room. I fucking love it, man. I yeah. love that whole scene. <laughs> And this, this is one of those scenes that when I was a kid, the first time I seen this, I got so scared of this scene that I wanted to cry. Like, this is one of the scenes that, like, it scared me so bad because I, I love horror. I mm. have always loved horror. I always will. But I'm not the gore hound. I've talked about it at the top. Ashley's the gore hound. I'm not. The gore <laughs> isn't what scares me. It's a story that scares me. Sure. Mm. The gore, I don't do it like blood, even like real blood. I'm out, dude. I oh, me too. Out. No, hundred yeah. percent. And real violence, I'm out. I, I handle it. Not I a fan. Yeah. It may have other people's blood on me at any given time, yeah. so it doesn't bother me. See, and to see the, you know, the veins and the arteries just ripped out, and him walking, and you know, what, what can he do? Like he's being pulled, and his facial expressions throughout this whole scene too. Something we haven't talked about: the pure agony and fear. All yeah. at the same time that are running through this kid, which remind you, this kid, you know, it's it's such a heartbreaking scene. I, I I couldn't make a list without making this number one for me. So the number one for me is Philip. Before we get to your list, my love, all together, um, Lauren says, "Hell yeah, the babysitter kill was great." I'm assuming we're talking about New Nightmare, and I completely agree. Devin said, "Mind blown," and I'm thinking it's because of Nancy's sibling that died. I hope I'm not yeah, wrong there. Totally. But I'm sorry. I hate to be um, that guy. I'll be uh, I'll be right back. I gotta run for a sec. I'll okay. be back in two seconds. Okay. Um, happy Halloween. Happy Halloween to you as well. Graphic. Um, while Jay's gone, I want to remind everybody: if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button down here. I also have Jay and Josh's social media links down here in the description. Follow them on social media if you have not already. I have Jay's horror uh, daily horror habit podcast down here in the description. So make sure you're clicking that and subscribing to that. If you haven't, Weird Science, Josh's hip-hop persona, is all over the internet. You can get it on iTunes, Apple Music, um, any place that sells music. I strongly recommend it. Start off with Girl Your Baby's Worm Food if you're going to listen to a single because that is <laughs> my fucking jam. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> dude, and, and can we just talk about real quick? Listen, I'm not trying to kiss your ass, Josh. We're friends. I don't have to kiss your ass. <laughs> yeah, you but don't. Can we talk about... Um, I can't think of the title of the track right now. There's a bomb in your city, in your town. Oh, yeah, yeah. That song is fucking incredible. Yeah, the that was like... That, what's, what's the title of that track? Uh, How to Be a... Because it was originally called How to Be a Terrorist. And they said, you know, dude, like, we're letting you put this on the record, but you can't call it that. And I was like, why? This is hip-hop. Like, And they were like, 
you know, this is like 2002, you know, it was like, this right. Shit. Um, maybe 2003. I know it didn't come out till after that, but that song was written and recorded a few years before. But somebody in the studio said uh, somebody should do a song about like how to make a bomb, and they just left it at that. And I was like, well, I don't really want to do a song just about how to make a bomb, but what if we did it like you know, it's like a common hip hop trope, like yeah, um, you know, you're talking about one thing the whole time, but it's really about this. You're talking, you know, and it's so. That was our try at that, and uh, I like that song. Actually, Dude, you're, you're that today. I can't that. believe the you brought that up. The first verse of that whole song is so sick, man. Um, I, I fucking and like you said, how it flips the script. And, you know, we're talking about twist endings. Listen to the song "How to Be" by Weird Science. And you're gonna get a great <laughs> twist ending there. Yeah, please listen for the whole ending, because man, some people were like, "Dude, what the fuck?" And I was like, "Well, whole, it's like you know, that's a common." Um, I used to love her by common was a great song that did that. Yeah. It's like you had like the twist ending and that was mm-hmm. like something crafty and we wanted to try our hand at it. You know, I listen now and there's a couple moments I could have gone a little bit, uh, you know, you always think you could like better what you do, but mm-hmm. um, maybe took some different directions. I don't want to say better. Cause I thought that song was like that record has some songs. I, I'm still really proud of that being one of them. I can't believe you brought that song, dude. I just listened to that shit today and I haven't <laughs> listened to it in an ages. The the, uh, whole, the the line where it's like the American media greedier than the average media eater, like that whole fucking line. Like every time I listen to it, I'm like, Jesus Christ, Josh, this is fucking sick. Yeah. So yeah, dude. Like well, thanks, I used Ken. To That's people, all. Like, that, that makes my day. I'm gonna get blush over here. I'm gonna get all. <laughs> no, when, red. when I was younger, dude, because that came out when I was in high school, and I, you know, I, people were talking about white rappers. And I was like, check this shit out, man. You want to hear a white rapper? Here you fucking go. I, you know, everybody that doesn't know, I'm a Detroit boy. So, you know, yeah. there's all Eminem here, but I was like, check this shit out. And every time we get to that part of your flow in the verse, they'd be like, damn. I'm like, yeah, oh, that was oh. a good one, man. Wait till you get to the end. There were all these old school dudes in the studio that like, you know, we're definitely like trying to like push it in like a direction of like funny. And I felt like that song really encapsulated, like it was crafty. It was just funny enough. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we went overly funny and it was definitely very, dude, Eminem was such a huge influence. Eminem came out and just like, blew our minds like yeah i could never hide that like total mind blown and then we dig back into his raucous record shit and discovered cage and a bunch idea all kinds of people man um and i was just like budding with creativity back then i even in the coheats i get home from tour and the next day i'm in the studio and then you know i kind of got old and lost like that hunger it's like you got a family and my dog i miss my dogs i want to go cuddle with my dogs and I like to watch horror movies, but when I listen to that record, I, I can feel the hunger and I got a lot of love for it. We're doing the final weird science show on the, on the yeah. SS never ender. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm a little, it's like uh, bittersweet in a way, you know, it's like, I think I'm going to put, put it to bed. I'm 41. Um, but who knows like Jason Voorhees, like Freddie, who knows if it'll stay dead. I'm a fan of things that don't stay dead for very long. We always tell you it's dead and then it comes back. So I'm right. not surprised. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know if you can answer this yet or not, Josh, but does how to be a make the cruise set list is the question that Devin asks. Um, I don't want to say cause right. Maybe. Yeah. That's why I was listening to it today. And, um, maybe we'll see. Maybe. <laughs> There you go. Um, Poor Devin. Go. I never give a good answer. Uh, maybe. That tells <laughs> Devin, me literally nothing he didn't already know. Yeah. <laughs> you want to give us your list, babe, from honorable mention now? Yeah. Um, my honorable mentions were from Nightmare 2, um, Coach Schneider, and then um, Nightmare 5, Dan Jordan, um, emerging into the motorcycle. 10 was Greta. Um, 9 was Mama Marge. Eight was Julie. Um, seven was Chris from um, 2010 Remake. Six was from Three Dream Warriors, Phil. Um, five was from um, Freddy's Dead, Carlos. Four was Sheila from Four. Three is A Nightmare on Elm Street 2010 Remake. Um, Nancy's mom um, getting stabbed through the, the uh, mirror. Two was um, Primetime Bitch, and number one, um, which is had to be on my list, um, was from the first one, um, Tina's Kill. But I mean, we uh, you knew it, right? I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's his first kill, and I mean, it's just, it holds a special place in my heart. And um, 
Yeah, it's just a really good kill. And um, I, w- I watched something about how they you were talking about practical effects. Like, the room was, like, a revolving room mm-hmm. when they did that. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I love that kill. I love that movie. I've always said that. I think that A Nightmare on Elm Street is the perfect horror movie if you take out the last five minutes with that dumb fucking Freddy car. Um, Wait, when you say the last five minutes... That seems like a big chunk of time. Like, it's really are you... only like the last five seconds or something. No, I think that the movie should have ended with Freddy oh, killing God. March. Like that should have been. So the he end kills of the movie. her. They they fade into the bed. Hmm. Maybe he comes hit, back hit in the room. The scream. You know, because they, they they when they wrote the movie, that's where it ended. Yeah. But the studio came in and said, "We need something here to set up a sequel." And so, they okay. Wrote that. Okay. The movie ended though with Nancy comes back into the room and Freddie starts coming back out of the bed and she says, I'm not afraid of you anymore. And that's when he dies, right? That was the original mm-hmm. ending. Yes. Yeah. And then they put in the silliness. God, yeah. that probably would have been a better ending. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. I feel you. Yeah. Um, why couldn't they have a sequel? If that was the ending, it wasn't like a death, 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 where you're like, well, there's no way that guy that's made out of fucking magic can come back, you know? Like, <laughs> right. like, yeah. like and I agree with you. Like, and what's the magic is, man. The way that movie ends has nothing to do with the sequel anyway. I know. Dude, I know. Dude, I will say, you know, it's job well done. Like, I had such a crush on Heather Lang. Oh my God. I just thought she was the bee's knees and like, um, you know, worked on me. I was a young kid. She's the final girl, whatever they call, whatever kind of term they attached to. Like I loved her and I was so worried about her. Then nightmare two comes out and nothing. We have no idea what the fuck happened. Right. <laughs> like those bastards. You want to know something really cool? Two good friends of mine, um, James A. Janice and Chelsea Rebecca of the dead meat podcast two good friends of mine and um, Heather Langenkamp is going to minister their wedding. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. She's marrying them. That's wild. That's so awesome. (laughs) Isn't that dope as fuck? That's very cool. That's as cool as it gets. Yeah. (laughs) That's what I said. What's funny is. I thought that was a joke. No, that's legit. Oh, I thought that was a joke. (laughs) No, it's funny because James just interviewed Jamie Lee Curtis for Halloween Kills. And she was like, if you need a minister, I'll do it. He's like, we're having Heather Langen camp. And she's like, oh, well, fuck you then. <laughs> that's, oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's very cool. Yeah. So um, real quick, Nene, uh, the Freddy car scene kind of undermines the whole movie. Understatement. I agree. Um, the what? They, they said the Freddy car scene kind of undermines the whole movie. I mean, hmm. it's just saying that it's not over. I don't, it's like. The only thing that, like, I get is that the top, it's, like, a little too quirky for that movie. Right. Um, the top being red and green. I did in that movies that made us, it was way deeper than that, and they cut it out. Like, the the gears were little Freddy gloves. They had all kinds of corny shit, and they cut that out. So, thank God, Ken, you to really flip your... Could, I was going to say, could you imagine? Yeah. Like, it is cheesy. It's cheeky. Um mm which was kind of a weird, and then they talk about in the movies that made us about how bad it looks when the mom, but like, I don't know, it played for me when I was a kid. I get it now. You're right. You're a hundred. I, I told while loving it, that scene still, I totally agree with you that it probably would have been better if it ended. I, yeah. I, I think it's definitely like a sore spot, but I, I don't know. I think that that film is so influential and still holds up so incredibly well, not just from, again, like the practical stuff, but just from Nancy herself, the whole structure of it, blending urban legend with the slasher element and whatnot. I don't know. I, I wouldn't frame it like it undermines it. It definitely is like, how could you end this almost perfect slasher in my mind with that ending? But if I don't know if I would ended, say it undermines it. If, we, if you would have ended four, five, one of them with it, where you already had that schlock type of Freddy Krueger, I think it would have, yeah. maybe it wouldn't have hit me as hard. It would have but, played better because yeah, that's the tone that was set. Better in one of them. But the, obviously when you're writing the first film and you get told to make an ending, you're not thinking four or five sequels down the road. You know, they don't right. know if this is even going to catch on. I mean, I'm sure mm-hmm. they knew that it would because it's a brilliant idea and a brilliant film and, I put it in my top three practical effect movies of all time with American Werewolf in London and um, 
the thing, you know, John Carpenter's mm. the thing. Those are my three. I don't think I'm not saying they're the best, but those are my three favorite practical effects films of all time. I'd throw the, the fly in there, but that's yeah, a pretty good, that's there, a but, pretty good list. Yeah. You talking about? No, I, I watched the thing again. Did you guys like the thing remake? I, I, I have the same. I have the same problem with that as I do with the nightmare. Um, you had this perfect practical effect movie, and then you put this film out and completely dominate it with bad looking CGI. Um, the story was great. I love how it, you learn at the end that it was an actual prequel to the first one, mm -hmm. but the, the CGI effects really fucking bump. I felt the way about the thing reboot, Josh, as you felt about American werewolf in Paris. It ruined my Christmas, bro. Yeah, dude. The same thing though. Same thing. You've got this movie that like part of it is this like, not a charm, but like this legendary transformation scene oh. and you're gonna fucking give us paris with its uh, like fucking video game werewolves and it's just such a letdown yeah paris could have been good man like well if it was a different movie i feel like it could have been good <laughs> it's completely different but i'll, I'll say uh, i just uh i just wrote an article actually for uh this website culturevultures.com which people should check out that has a great uh group of writers like myself that really love horror and we're trying to give uh, a shine to horror on that site. Uh, some films maybe that other people don't necessarily uh, love as much as some of us do. But I just did like a retrospective on the thing because it turned or the thing prequel, which just turned ten years old this month or this uh, year rather. And uh, yeah, like the CGI is still not the best, but in recently watching it, I found that it held up a little better than I remembered. And what I found was more important is that the different forms that the thing takes they at least feel like they are continuations from the original in a way, yeah. right? It doesn't, it, they could have gotten crazy with it considering the CGI, right? They could have had like the thing flying around and all this like weird types of nonsense that they CGI would have given them the benefit of. And it's not the best CGI, but I found that it held up a little bit better, even if, you know, it's a completely unnecessary movie. Yeah. I definitely found that it was a little more entertaining maybe than uh, mm -hmm. than I gave it credit for the first time I watched it because I fucking hated it the first time no, I watched it. I haven't seen it since um, the theater. I have not right. watched well, it well, since see, the theater. And that's how I felt yeah. about it. I, I didn't mind the movie. I think, you know, like yeah. you said, I love the story of it and how you learn it's a prequel there at the end. But That was right. cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah just the thing that the CGI really fucking bummed me out, man, because well, I go into this movie with the state, like I said, with American Werewolf in Paris, with the Nightmare mm -hmm. on Elm Street remake. I go in this movie like, let's see what they can do with these effects now. And it's not even the CGI that bothers me. It's the shitty looking CGI, you know? Like, yeah. Like, and, you, you could blow us away with computer. Like, are yeah. you kidding? The Matrix? Well, Hello? Mm -hmm. But like, what? This well, is it, what we're doing? Like, it's a, it's a shame, too, because the movie originally was going to have practical and uh, practical work. And they had all this animatronics work behind it. Mm -hmm. But then it didn't test well. And so the studio said, we're going to replace all of that with CGI. So in the last, the, bummer, in man. the 12th hour, they did away with all of the practical work and all the animatronics that were supposed to be behind it, which would have made the movie at least somewhat better received. I would think. Who um, are these test audiences? Like a, a test audience it, is. It's not delicate. us. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's not us. <laughs> right. It's, it's what they, I mean, I would assume, right, right. I've never been part of a test audience, but I would assume that they're drawing from, a mass market audience because that's really who buys tickets, right? Well, it's more about, enough. it's, it's less about the niche audiences, which is unfortunate because those that's are the people that for. those movies should be made for. But yeah, but don't you think when something connects with us, right? If all three of us are like, Holy shit, have you seen this movie? It generally does connect like to a mass because it's good and we like it because it's good. And that ultimately is what wins fans i get what you're saying i, I think, would love to be a part yeah. of test audiences that would be the, sick i wonder me too the landscape i think of movies in general is so fucked now because you look at like you look at movies that make 200 300 million dollars in a weekend and it's like why would we make this thing that makes i don't know 50 at best and yeah why not i don't agree with it but it it is an unfortunate reality but i mean this is something that i think has been a shame about the pandemic is a lot of, especially horror movies haven't been getting their due and they've been released in limited releases. And then they've only been in theaters for a couple of weeks. But I mean, stuff like Halloween kills, even if it is divisive, we're seeing a resurgence. No, I'm coming, I mean, I think it made 50 million or something like 50, that, even though 50, it was on pan. 55 uh, million. Peacock. Even it was on Peacock. Yeah. So, I mean, 
I watched it on Peacock, yeah, but it's still yeah. like I literally am like kicking my legs excited that I can watch <laughs> Halloween Kills in my hotel room. Yep. Like I do love I love going to the movies, but guess what I didn't have to deal with? Some dude on his phone yep. or crinkling yep. bags and like I love the theater. I think from now on I might just rent the whole theater and call I mean, my own buddies that yeah. I can yell at if they act up. Like but, real quick, I want to know if you guys in the chat right now. Y'all know about the Antlers movie this month. Have you guys heard of Antlers? And Finally. how excited are you for it? Finally getting know. released. Yeah, I want to see it. Yeah. Like It comes out, what, the 30th, I think? 29th. The 29th, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and here's something, Nene. Um, we've talked about this before. The bad, the creature in uh, the the Wendigo, or however you say it, is the same one from Pet Cemetery, the, the myth of Pet Cemetery. And hmm. um, Ashley and I are actually almost completed with our pet cemetery fan film script and oh, cool. um it's going to be based around the remake those kids in the masks yeah yeah mm. and it's going to be like maybe this town has a reason for what they're doing oh, and so cool. we have that and and we're, we kind of got a bunch of feathers in the cap right now we have a pet cemetery fan film we're going to be making we have an evil dead 2 fan film we're going to be making which i'll explain that to you guys once the stream is over because i don't want to get too much of that info out there but um, and then obviously we're going to Salem and we got something up our sleeve while we're there. So, um, oh, cool. man, I want to thank you guys for coming on here with us. Yeah. This has been fucking amazing. Everybody yeah, listening to the man. chat. If you watch this, this on a replay, please check out Weird Science. If you d <laughs> buy every Coheed record, you can. <laughs> Daily Horror Habit podcast. The links are down here. Their social media links are down here as well. Follow these guys on social media. Um, guys, don't go anywhere. I still want to talk to you guys about a couple things. Sure. Everybody else, as always. Keep talking horror. Stay what you are. And we'll see you guys soon. Bye. Peace. Thanks for listening.